that IS MOPH, that is International Students Meet on Public Health, a satellite event of 40 World Congress on Public Health. And the topic we choose for today's workshop, one of the very interesting and upcoming topic, health economics. The workshop is organized by IPHA headquarters in collaboration with IBSK, Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata. And uh, let me introduce our lead facilitator, Dr. Ajit Chakraborty, Professor of Economics and Director, Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata. He is the Director of Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata. He obtained his PhD in Economics from the University of California at Riverside, US. He was earlier a member of the faculty at the Center of Development, Center for Development Studies, Kivantaburam, and a guest faculty for health economics at the Achuta Menon Center for Health Science Studies, Kivantaburam. His areas of research are welfare economics, development economics, human development, health economics, and methodology of economics. He has published widely in national and international journals. So with this, I am now handing over the session to our respected uh, sir, Dr. Ochi. Uh, very good morning to all of you. And uh, my thanks to Dr. Shanti Mukhubadhyay for a nice introduction. Uh, well, we are supposed to start at 9.30, and uh, now it's uh, 9.45, so we are all, uh, already we are 15 minutes behind the scene. Yeah. Uh, quite a bit. Within this uh, limited time, uh, but just uh, in the way of introduction, uh, a few uh, points I'd like to mention at the outset. Uh, this particular session, World Economics, when I was approached uh, to organize this particular session, uh, my immediate response was that who are the takers? Uh, who are the people who would be interested in health economics? Mostly public health researchers, I am told, and also maybe some <coughs> social scientists might be, not from medical profession, but from other <coughs> disciplines. So it's going to be uh, an interdisciplinary uh, kind of uh, participants. That is what I have understood. That's why I have uh, designed uh, the sessions uh, accordingly. Uh, my name is Achin Chakraborty, and the other three uh, members of this uh, other three resource persons are my colleague, uh, two of my colleagues, Dr. Shubhra Mukherjee and Dr. Shivantini Mukhopadhyay. Both of them have worked in the area of health economics and have published extensively in this area. And, uh, and Dr. Arifita Dr. is from uh, the Department of Economics of University of Calcutta. So that is how we have organized these four of us. We'll take up four different uh, sessions, consecutive sessions. The first one actually will start <coughs> with uh, basically some conceptual and methodological introduction to uh, what health economics researchers actually do or what they are expected to do. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, its title it is Economists' Approach to Health and Healthcare. Uh, we have given a small uh, two-page note. Uh, we didn't make it too long because if it's a longer one, then uh, then 
not be possible to do it now. So that's why it's a short two-page note. Uh, basically, it sends out the things that we are going to do in these four sessions and some select references, but we can supply more references as we go along. And many of these uh, articles and some of these reports, uh, they're available uh, through net, uh, but I think most of them are easily available. Okay, so what do we mean by this economy's efforts to health and care and why? Uh, it's important in the context of public health. So that's the uh, point. <clears throat> uh, I think some of you, I, I guess some of you uh, have already exposed to some of these mythological aspects of health economics. Probably some of you have already done some work in this area. Uh, so please bear with me if some of these things sound too familiar to you. But, uh, but uh, this is a kind of time tested lecture because I used to give this lecture at Archita Medical Center for uh, Health Science Studies in <coughs> Health Sciences in Tiruvannathapuram. That's part of the Chitra Tribunal uh, uh, And uh, they have this Masters in Public Health. And uh, so they have, again, it's a Masters in Public Health. It's much more oriented towards social sciences and statistics and health economics kind of uh, thing. So there, in fact, I designed a health economics course and taught for a couple of years there. Recently, I taught a very similar kind of course uh, uh, on invitation from the Department of Health, uh, Government of West Bengal. They have, I think, they have a program on health hospital management. They are also, I guess, similar kind of lecture. So from my experience, I found that some of these things uh, probably other people find it interesting. So that's why I sort of uh, Repeat the approach here. Uh, if we start from this, <clears throat> if you want to know exactly what health economists are supposed to do, we need to know the basically the conceptual and methodological background. What exactly? What are the tools and techniques that economics as a discipline uh, offers, which could be used to illuminate? some of the uh, issues in health and health care. So that's the kind of uh, motivation that we have, that is economics tools and techniques, how we can meaningfully use them to illuminate certain aspects, not all, but certain aspects, some aspects of uh, uh, health care. Now as we know that uh, health care, I mean it's a mixed bag of things, and health care means a lot of things, it could be promotive or preventive, it could be curative. So if you ask a health economist how you make a distinction between curative healthcare and preventive or promotive healthcare, he has something to say on that. So I'll first explain that. And in the process, in fact, I'll explain quite a few concepts there. And this background actually is very important when you go along or when you you know, in the next stage when you actually do cost benefit or cost effectiveness analysis and things like that, okay? So this kind of background is, is uh, necessary, I, I feel. So basically the, uh, the basic idea behind economic approach, we all know that it's uh, basically resource limitation and it's optimal allocation. Now by resources, I mean, it's a very broadly defined resources. It's not just amount of money that you have, but it's the real resources in terms of you know all kinds of resources, no matter whether we have been able to monetize it or not. This is very important. So no matter we have been able to monetize certain resources or not, but resources nevertheless have to be valued by some means. So that's economic standard. Uh, so resource limitation, we know we all know that resources are limited. So given the limited resources, we have to find out some ways to allocate those resources optimally. We say optimal allocation of resources. Now, how do we go about it? Now, economics, real economics, or you know, real economies actually, have evolved and they have found in evolutionary ways, they have found some ways to do it, right? 
So one form of uh, uh, allocation or one kind of allocation mechanism is the obvious, that's the market kind of allocation mechanism. So markets or the system of market actually that allocates resources in a sense optimally. We'll discuss some of these things. Why in case of healthcare or public health in particular, public health of preventive and promotive kind, why the market fails in this particular context. So what are the features of these goods or services, which we call goods or services, basically services. Uh, what features are, uh, what are the features which actually make them different from other kinds of goods and services? So that's the first, first we have to clarify. So resource limitation, optimum allocation, and how do you look at health and healthcare? Basically, health you look at health as output and healthcare as input. But it again, as I have said, healthcare as a mixed bag of things. It could be promotive, it could be curative. Uh, so the third point that is, what is the nature of the good which is called healthcare? Okay. Now, if we make a distinction between curative and, and preventive or promotive kind of uh, healthcare. For instance, uh, when you think about vector control, okay. Now, vector control is a particular kind of service which requires some resources. But who is going to do that? Traditionally, we have seen that it's the government that does that, right? Either local government or you know uh, the upper tiers of government. So usually, the government does it. Things like vector control. Now, why is it that it's not done through private market? Now just like you know, private market produces and sells television, just like private market produces and sells bread or egg or whatever. So there is no public sector there. So why is it that vector control, we need to leave it to the public sector? The reason is that the nature of the good is different from television or bread or toothpaste. Why? Because what we call public good, it's a public good. Now, what is public good in economics? How is it defined? Now, public good, I'll go back and forth. I'll move to uh, the definition of public goods, and again, we will return to this. Now, public goods are defined in terms of these two features, you see. Now, just think about this situation where one individual can benefit from the good without limiting others' consumption or benefit. Just think about vector control. Just think about a malaria-free environment. Now, a malaria-free environment, right, if I consume that, it is available to you in undiminished quantity, isn't it? If you live in the same area, then if I consume whatever quantum of good that I'm consuming, that is malaria-free environment, or free from vector-borne diseases, that service actually is available to me, or whatever service I am consuming, it's still available to you in undiminished quantity. So that's why this kind of good, this kind of goods uh, are called uh, non drivable But bread, a piece of bread is not non drivable right? Because if I eat a piece of bread that is not available to you, that particular piece of bread is not available to you. So it is not non rival it's a rival good. So most of the goods that we buy from the market and, and consume, they are rival goods, but public goods have the feature which is called non rival That's one of the two features, non rival So is that clear what is non rival So non rival is something that if I consume that good, then it is available to you or anybody else in undiminished quantity. Unless you know the extreme case of congestion and things like that. Extreme case that you know in a small area, too many people have come here. Then because of congestion, because so other kinds of problems might. But otherwise, you know anyone can consume the same good and without raising any cost. That is, no additional cost is involved to provide it to an extra individual. An additional individual, no additional cost is involved. So that's the consequence of this non rival okay what is the second uh, feature of that the second feature is uh, if you want to exclude somebody from consuming that 
it's almost impossible or, or very difficult. You can do it at a very high cost, which doesn't work. I mean, which is not worth it. So, exclusion is impossible, almost. Now, why is it so important? It is important because just think about bread, think about the TV again. So, if you don't pay for that piece of bread, you won't get it. So, the provider or the seller of the bread can deny you if you don't pay for that. So, in other words, if you don't pay for that, you can be excluded from consumption of that good. So, that's why it's non, this excludable good. So, public health has this feature which is called non excludable. In other words, even if I don't pay for malaria free environment, you have no way to exclude me from consuming that so long as I'm a resident of that area or that country or the state. So, so long as I'm the resident of that area, you cannot exclude me from consuming vector, uh, you know, this free from vector borne diseases or malaria free environment, even if I refuse to pay. Even if I refuse to pay. So that's the second feature. So now if you combine these two features, then the immediate conclusion is that how can the private market provide this kind of good? Because private market, if I'm a private supplier or producer and seller, then I require excludability. So if you don't pay, I don't give you the good. Otherwise, how can I make profit? So this is the feature. So this is the feature that makes it impossible to, in, to uh, you know, price the good by a private provider. So as a consequence, public goods are underprovided. They're not provided enough because no private market will come forward to provide that. Now, if you, if you just listen to me carefully, you can now figure out that, see, I'm not bringing in any notion like, you know, healthcare is a matter of right, so everyone should get it. No. I'm not talking about any should question, ought to question. I'm not bringing in those normative questions. It's a pure economic logic that actually takes us to this point that wherever you find non-excludable and non-rival goods, then there is an immediate case for market, what might be called market failure. That means market fails to provide that. That means no private individual would be um, uh, uh, encouraged to supply or would be incentivized to supply that. Okay? So, now you know that, so what is the economic nature of the good that is healthcare? Now we know that most of the preventive and promotive things. Promotive to some extent, well, if you say that, okay, so you want to improve the nutritional status of a particular population, obviously that kind of promotive uh, thing, uh, it is excludable because if you don't provide the food, then that person won't have that nutritional status, right? So it's, it's not that, Everything that the government does or the state does, it has this public good feature. No. Sometimes it's non public good also, it's provided by the government on some other ground. So, not all the promotive public health interventions can be called public goods. You see? So, things like, you know, you know, vector borne diseases, like, you know, uh, are classically they are the public goods. I mean, there are other examples. I mean, in healthcare, there are a lot of examples. There are other examples also generally. Think about uh, you know national defense. Think about national defense. So, what kind of uh, service is that? National defense. It's not a private good. It's a public good. Why? Because it is non-excludable and non-rival. So long as you have certain defense capability, so no citizen of India can be excluded from consuming that defense capability, right? So we are protected. So we are all protected by the same quantum of service. And just because our population is growing, that doesn't mean that our protection level is equally divided among more and more citizens. No. So it's, it's available in undiminished quantities, right? So defense is the classic case of public good. So this public good thing is very important in the context of healthcare, as I said, that most of the preventive and promotive kind, you can put that in the definition of public good. Now, to what extent 
you know, how far healthcare is important for health, that is the outcome. You know, there's a huge literature actually on that. People have done quantitative uh, sort of uh, work, looking at cross-country data, and looking at this healthcare as input and health as outcome, output. So you can do regression and all, and you can find out that healthcare actually, particularly of curative kind, uh, is not uh, very significant in explaining uh, the health outcome of most of the countries. So this is well known in public health literature, right? That is, it is the, you know, basically the public health kind of interventions at some points of time historically, like sanit sanitation, safe water, safe drinking water, and things like that, which actually uh, influenced health outcome much more than the curative uh, uh, care. So these things are very much in the research, in research, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, you know, for a long time actually we have been reading about these things. So other inputs besides healthcare, these are, these are very important. That what are the other inputs which might influence health outcome besides healthcare? So you need a kind of regression technique, and you need to have several variables there, including you know non-healthcare kind of variables, and see you know how they what they turn out to be, you know, the relative importance of healthcare vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of inputs that get into health outcome. Uh, the other issue is that you look at healthcare as a kind of production. Because healthcare requires a production system. Healthcare, again, even though in health production, health production, healthcare is input, but healthcare itself is produced by other resources, right? So you can think of another production system where healthcare is the output and other resources are inputs, like doctors and paramedics and hospitals and you know, other resources. So with other resources, you produce an output which is called healthcare, but healthcare actually gets into the production function of health, that is health as an outcome. So you see that it's a kind of two-stage kind of production. That is how economists actually formalize uh, this entire health production function. <clears throat> so from production, so production, we'll talk about some of the problems in production that require some research uh, to know about the nature of the production and things like that. And from production to distribution, distribution in economics, by distribution, we basically we mean that who consumes what. That is ultimately, once you produce the service, healthcare, then who consumes what. In case of television, those who pay the price, they consume. In case of most of the private goods, without subsidies, those who pay, they, 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 they get to consume that. But there could be alternative distributional mechanisms, not just this kind of market-based or price system-based distribution. So price system-based distribution is one kind of alternational setup, we'll talk about that, and other kinds of non-price or non-market-based allocational mechanisms, we'll talk about that. And the point about market and market failure, we'll talk about that in a little bit detail. So the, this is this roughly actually summarizes what health any health economics book, where any health economic book, economics book you pick up, you'll find that these are the issues they talk about. But other details are there in the production system, different forms of market, and all these things. But I think for our purpose, for a workshop which is uh, devoted to uh, health economics research, I think this is good enough to, to know this conceptual background at the outset. And uh, so, so that we, we can understand any piece of research which is published in Journal of Health Economics or Journal of, <coughs> or there is a journal which is called Health Economics. And so, you know, Social Science and Medicine, uh, all kinds of journals which actually publish uh, uh, papers using health economic tools and techniques. <clears throat> the other important feature is this. Actually, quite often we ignore this particular thing, that consumer sovereignty, the idea of consumer sovereignty. So the idea of consumer sovereignty is very much there in standard mainstream economics. And health economics, they have this issue, you know, this issue that underlies all this, their, their uh, discussions. Now, why is it important? Because in standard economics, as I said, 
these allocation decisions or distributional decisions are informed by what do you mean by consumer sovereignty? That means, please don't try to do something that goes against consumers' willing to, willingness to accept. So, consumers' preferences. If consumers prefer something, then who am I to say that no, he should not do it? Now, you might object to this because if consumers want to smoke, then don't we interfere in that? Yes, that's paternalism. But that's not consumer sovereignty. So consumer sovereignty is a doctrine. Maybe it sounds extreme. In some cases, you ignore or you reject consumer sovereignty in case of you know lifestyle kind of thing. But nevertheless, it should be kept in mind that consumer sovereignty is a thing of value. Because as far as the consumers are concerned, otherwise you won't understand the, the growth of the private sector in a mixed kind of system where there is public and there is private. You won't be able to understand the, the, the evolution of the mix of public and private unless you understand this particular part that consumers are sovereign in certain domains. So consumer sovereignty applied to healthcare, if you apply it to healthcare, what are the problems? If you let consumers choose whatever they want to choose, then there are certain serious problems which we'll talk about, and that's why we have all these different kinds of intervention mechanisms and all. So this is, this is the logic behind it. Uh, the other issues are, you know, what kind of, even if you leave it to the market, what kind of market is that? Is that perfectly competitive market? Is that monopoly? Is that oligopoly? So things like that. Uh, so those things, and the last point actually is very important, importance of risk and uncertainty. So there are a lot of uh, huge literature in this area, the risk of uncertainty. And risk calculations, you know, uh, particularly it is applied in the context of health insurance. So when it, whenever it comes to health insurance, you cannot do any analysis of health insurance without understanding the notion of risk and uncertainty. Okay, so this is broadly the uh, outline of it. <clears throat> so as I have already mentioned this, that, uh, you know, from the nature of the good, it follows that what would be the mode of organization of that production and distribution of that good, okay? If it is, as I said, if it is bread or television, we have no problem in leaving it to the market. Why? Because it's not a public good. And the next thing that we'll talk about later, it's, it doesn't have any externalities, there's no asymmetry of information, etc. So we'll come to that step by step. So market as a mode of organization or allocation, I have already said that if there is no problem of this kind of failure due to either public good or other things, then uh, market is perfect, no problem. Unless, unless the ultimate outcome is something which the society is not ready to accept from ethical point of view. So market is perfectly all right. For instance, if you if you if you if you let uh, you know production of marijuana uh, increase, it will definitely produce uh, be produced and consumed. Now marijuana may not be acceptable at the societal level, so government may step in and stop that production of that. or you know other kinds of uh, drugs or stuff, things like that. So, but otherwise, otherwise market allocation for private goods is fine, no problem with that unless there is an ethical issue. Second kind of ethical issue is this, that is market allocation may lead to exclusion of certain people from the market. So if the society feels that these people should not be excluded from consuming that good, then the state would like to intervene in that market. Otherwise, it should be left to the market, okay? So market has certain strength, certain weaknesses, so we'll talk, we'll talk about this. But the, Problem is that market actually fails to allocate resources if there exist uh, public, good, public goods. I have already said that because the, pro the, the output, the, the, the product actually will not be produced at all. It will be under provided. No one is there to provide that. So that's the case of market failure. That means just because you have left it to the, for instance, better control or malaria free uh, environment, if you leave it to the market, private individuals 
the spray in the neighborhood and all. Why should they do that? They will do at a price, right? So who is going to pay that price? So, if I refuse to pay to that person, can I say that no, I'm not going to serve you? Because my neighbor may, like, may, may, may be willing to pay that, pay for that. So that will be there in any case. So I will get the benefit of that. So this is, called, this is called a problem of free riding. So this problem of free riding is a consequence of the nature of the good that is public good. So this is problem of free riding. One, one aspect of this uh, market for healthcare, that is, there may be possibility of market failure because of public good. What would be the other reasons? The next reason would be externalities. Now, what, what do you mean by externalities? Now, think about tuberculosis, for instance. Now, tuberculosis, tuberculosis, what kind of service is that? Tuberculosis eradication or, you know, prevention or whatever. What kind of service is that? Now, it's actually based on certain input at the individual level, right? It's not like, you know, spraying that thing to control mosquitoes and things like that. Someone has to take that medicine, right? So here actually, ideally, it is excludable. So that medicine can be sold in the market, and if someone doesn't consume that, uh, you know, that doesn't pay for that, then that person doesn't get that medicine. So that medicine actually here, or you know, cure of tuberculosis, cure at the individual level, okay, that's done through this medicine, this regime of uh, medicine, and that is a private good. It's not public good. But then what is the problem? The problem is that if I don't consume just because I don't have money and I cannot pay for that, it is sold in the market, I don't pay, I cannot pay for that, I, I don't have the ability to pay, ability to pay, then in fact I do harm to others. So here, this exclusion from the market for tuberculosis medicine, exclusion from that market actually creates negative externality on others. So that's the notion of externality, right? So. If any good that has negative externality on others, then again, market really cannot allocate it in, in optimal way. Why? Because there will be many people with tuberculosis, they won't be consuming that medicine, which means that tuberculosis control, which is a societal goal, would be much more difficult, even though at the individual level, I don't care. I don't care because I don't have money, I don't want that medicine. I live with tuberculosis. I have decided to live with tuberculosis. I have no other option. But you know, so it's a constrained kind of choice that I have decided. So my decision actually affects your well-being or your health. If my decision to consume certain things, certain health product affects your well-being or your health, then it's externality. It could be positive externality, it could be negative externality. So negative externality is that if I have, if I continue with tuberculosis, that's negative externality on my neighbor. But if I consume that medicine, then it will create positive externality on my neighbor. So that, that is how we, we, we think about positive and external, uh, positive and negative externalities, okay? So again, if there is a negative externality, of having tuberculosis, then tuberculosis prevention will be under provided if it is left to the market. Is that point clear? If it is left to the market, if I don't have money, I'm, I'm not consuming. So in that case, the tuberculosis medicine will be bought and sold in a smaller quantity. Those who have tuberculosis, some of them will be excluded. So in other words, it would be under consumed and under produced, right? Because, why? Because that externality is not being taken into account when it is being consumed and produced. Okay? But that may not be true for, for some other curative conditions, right? So if someone is not willing to pay or not able to pay, 
his or her health will be in jeopardy. But it may not have any effect on others if it is not contagious disease, if it is you know, uh, something different, if it is chronic, for instance. Uh, it's not, you know, there's no effect on others. You know, through indirect ways, maybe, you know, if I, if I suffer from kidney failure or something, my family may suffer. That's a different thing. That's an economic loss of it. But the direct effect of preventing or curing one kind of disease in one individual, if that has repercussions on others' health, then it is a question of Is the point clear? Uh, the third point is asymmetry of information. Asymmetry of information, again, it's pervasive in, in healthcare. Now, what is this asymmetry of information? In standard economics, actually, we believe that market is ideal when everyone has perfect information. That means the producers and sellers, they know what they're selling. The consumers know what they're buying. So if consumers know fully well what they're buying, then there is no problem of imperfect information or asymmetry of information between the provider and the consumer. All right? But you know that in case of curative care, doctor definitely has more information than the patient. So if I go to the doctor, then I don't know what I am consuming. I'm not an expert, so I don't know what I'm consuming. So the price that I'm paying, I have no way to sort of assess that particular price, whether I should pay this or that not. In the television market, I can do that. There are different brands, and I can even test those things going to the shop. In the car market, some asymmetry of information is there, but so long as the you know, brand actually signals the quality of the thing, just like a uh, sort of well-known doctor, the brand of the doctor actually signals that he's a good doctor. Uh, so this kind of branding sometimes reduces that asymmetry of information. But what is the other, other way of reducing that asymmetry of information? Regulation. That's why these you know, doctors registration. Now, why, why do the doctors have to register? Because by registration, we, you know, so that's a kind of control on the quality of the doctor, doctor services. So, you know, the government actually tries to reduce that asymmetry of information between the provider of the service and the and the consumers, right? So the, that's why we have registration of doctors. So that's one example of why how asymmetry of information actually comes. In. But the other thing, actually, asymmetry of information is more pervasive actually in the insurance market. So towards the end, if I have some time. I'll talk about the insurance market as well, okay? So because of this asymmetry of information, then in a, another research person has done. Dr. Shimon, did you go over that? You can sit here. Uh, so the immediate consequence of that asymmetry of information uh, is that the market is not competitive. But you can see that some bits of competition, if you look at this curative care market, particularly the outpatient care market in Kolkata now, and there are so many providers for outpatient care, right? So many private hospitals, they have outpatient department. Now outpatient care, you know that the charge for visits in outpatient care units of any private hospital, they don't vary too much. In any big city, they don't vary too much. Why? Because it's a competitive market. If I charge a very high price for my outpatient services, then patient will go to some other place. But as far as inpatient care is concerned, that competition doesn't work anymore. Once you are in, then it's very difficult to shop around. You cannot just get in and get out like this, right? But outpatient market actually, you can shop around. You know that, oh, so what is the price? 200 rupees? Oh, they are charging 800 for the same? No, I won't go to 800, I, I'll go for 200 because basically it's the same thing. But as soon as you, you are in the 
hospital, inpatient care, then you are in the hands of those entrepreneurs. And then uh, it's a monopoly. So this is very important that where actually some semblance of competition actually there, or where competition is almost impossible. So you leave it to the private market, but if there is a monopolizing tendency of that private market, then you have to do something about that. Because monopoly market actually is not optimal market. The allocation is not optimal if it is a monopoly market. So just so far, I haven't talked about anything about ethical side of it. Anything about healthcare as a right or health as a right no, you don't need to talk about these things as far as these issues are concerned. That means where market fails, where you need to have an alternative organizational form. I'm not saying that it must be government, but alternative institutional form, alternative organizational form. So we'll talk about a little bit about these alternative institutional forms. But it's 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 good to recognize that you know this kind of hard-headedness is needed. And health economics provides that hard-headedness to say that, look, here there is a clear case of market failure, so market will be will be under-providing the service. So you won't get it in the market, basically. That's the point. That's the so asymmetric information, having said that, now I move on to. <clears throat> so non-competitive non behavior of providers, that's an issue. And uh, so you see that. <clears throat> Uh, in, even in the rural areas where there are several quarks, <coughs> several quarks, they're doing good business, but none of them actually is, strictly speaking, monopoly as such, because they have competitors. They have competitors in government hospitals, they have competitors in private chambers, they have competitors everywhere. So that's why you see that the prices that the quarks charge they cannot be exorbitant because of this competition from others. But in a remote in a remote uh, rural area where you know there is only one quark, <laughs> that is a monopoly, right? So this monopoly competition and sometimes oligopoly, oligopoly means actually several providers actually they just collude and they price a they, they, they charge a price uh, which is not competitive price much about that. So from here actually now we we know that. So if you look at the research papers which uh, basically use uh, health economic, lo the logic of health economics, you'll find that the, some of the research papers, they use some kind of explanatory kind of uh, method. That is, you know, they start from that how people choose, and then they explain what the outcome is. So like that explanation of things, right? So explanation of things, like, you know, uh, why is it that uh, this particular, in this particular country, this uh, intervention actually didn't work? Now, when you want to analyze that, that's an explanatory kind of uh, mode, actually, you are in. But the other kind of research, actually, research inquiry, you will find that it's a normative or, or evaluative kind of inquiry, right? That means you just try to find out with whether the outcome that you have seen, the outcome that has uh, that is there, you just assess or evaluate that with certain criteria and say that, uh, you know, this is good or bad or whatever, given some parameters, given some goals, given some objectives of the society or the system, health system. So we'll talk, talk, a brief, talk briefly about those things. So in other words, basically, uh, we, we make a distinction between, uh, I mean, that distinction you won't find in the research papers as such, but when you read the research papers, you can keep in mind that you know this is exclusively on the email. For instance, I can give you uh, plenty of examples of that kind. Uh, for instance, in Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh, I have seen that <clears throat> some of the public health issues are extremely severe, like for instance, arsenic. Arsenic is problem right from the you know um, uh, early 90s, actually. So now it's almost like uh, 25, quarter of a century. This arsenic problem is very much there. And there are numerous studies on this arsenic in Bangladesh. <laughs> And then, in fact, many of these earlier studies, you find that basically what they do is that they look at this arsenic problem and they calculate some kind of loss due to arsenic to the, to the population and the economy, ultimately to the, to the economy. 
So they have some kind of assumptions regarding GDP loss or something. And then you say that because of this arsenic related morbidity, arsenic related mortality and morbidity, so at the end of the day, actually, you lose GDP for the next 20 years by 20% or 15% or something like that. Now this is a this is very much evaluative inquiry, right? It is no explanation as such. It is evaluative. That means how do you how do you assess the problem of arsenic? You assess the problem of arsenic in terms of economic loss. That's not the only criteria to apply. But these health economists, they apply only that criteria, saying that at the end of the day, this much of GDP is lost because of this uh, loss in labor force and things like that. Now this labor force loss and then ultimately GDP loss, this is a particular evaluative position that you are taking. I may not agree with you. There could be other alternative evaluative criteria as well. So why do you have to talk about arsenic problem in terms of GDP loss only? So this is one approach of health economists, which not everyone actually agrees to. But nevertheless, in terms of our uh, these categories, I will put this uh, research in the first category that is evaluative. Basically evaluative, but with certain value position on that. So you are taking a value position which says that GDP loss is the only criteria that should be applied to any kind of public health problem. <clears throat> so why all these uh, evaluative things actually come out then? Now what do you need to evaluate them? The evaluation can be done at the systemic level. That means the system. You are talking about health system. Now when you say health system, definitely health system actually has all kinds of providers. There are private providers, private, private providers of all kind. There are public providers. There are non-profit uh, private providers, but there are for-profit private providers. So all kinds of providers are there. So when you talk about health system, then health system actually consists of all this, all the providers and all the users of those services. Okay. Now, when the health system is something like this, then you need to, I mean, sometimes you may like to evaluate that. So for instance, you know, how do you compare a uh, Canadian system of health care or Canadian health system with US health system, for instance, American health system? Now we know that there is huge difference between them. Or how do you compare British health system with US health system? Obviously there are huge differences. So what are the differences that you should ideally look at? Now, here broadly, I would say that <clears throat> okay. So broadly, at the system level, when you when you assess a system, then we are basically not doing cost effectiveness. What we are doing actually, we are doing system assessment. Now in system assessment, there are a variety of approaches, but what are the goals? Now goals, in case of cost effectiveness, which Subrudu will uh, talk about it in detail. Now cost effectiveness actually looks at this particular interventions. And then you look at alternative interventions and look at the uh, minimum resources needed to to achieve that particular service or that particular outcome, that particular condition. But when you evaluate the system, then that's not good enough. You need to have some idea about the distributional implications of the outcome as well, right? So that's why this this entire this health economics literature actually has gone into this direction where they actually evaluate the system in terms of the distribution of the outcome, right? So market failure actually refers to optimal allocation, optimal in the sense of what might be called efficiency. That means efficiency, why? Because 
A system has to be efficient, definitely. An inefficient system actually uh, leads to less or lower outcome, definitely, or inferior outcome. But that's not good enough. So you have to have some notion of what might be called the distributional uh, distribution is just for this. So this equity is a complex question, but <clears throat> I'll talk about briefly that how health economists actually look at this question of equity or inequality. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> actions will be, that's how it's planned, done at the end of uh, the sessions. So we have this interaction session uh, in the afternoon. So I utilize the full time here so that I, I mean, if you have any questions, uh, comments, or observations, please keep it to yourself so that uh, at the end of this, at the end of the day, we'll discuss all of them together so that we can efficiently uh, utilize our time, uh, if not equity oriented. Uh, if, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'll stop at here. <coughs> Oh, 10.30 is there. Okay. Oh, I thought it's 11, no? Oh, no, 10.30. Uh, I'm sorry. Actually, I, I sort of misunderstood everything. Okay, just the just last one point. Actually, I had several other things to say, but I think I have made my point. Uh, but uh, during the interaction session, we can, we can discuss some of these things more uh, in more detail. So, uh, I stop here. And next is uh, Shudroto. Shudroto will continue. Uh, oh, now, now it's a tea break or something, right? Yeah. So after that, we come back at 11? Yeah. 11. Okay. So 11 to 12 is Shudroto. Okay. Thank you very much. I stopped here. Thank you. Session, uh, this will be taken by uh, Dr. Shudroto Mukherjee. Uh, Dr. Shudroto Mukherjee. Uh, he received his PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and after that, he was postdoctoral fellow at Montreal University, Canada, for few years there. And just published widely in international journals on health economics related issues. He is now with us at the Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata, doing health economic research, and also he is the coordinator of our MPhil in Development Studies program. So he's an extremely busy person, so but in spite of that, Subhuta has agreed to take this session. So Subhuta will talk about cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis, which is the kind of natural culmination of what I said, and now moving into this more specific cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis. And Subhuta will continue till 12. Okay. Good morning to everybody and uh, thank you Professor Chakravarti for a very generous uh, and probably exaggerated introductions. Uh, let me uh, start with uh, something which I have not done. Uh, uh, Please close the door. Yeah. Okay, I assume that uh, uh, most of our participants are predominantly from uh, the medical science background. Now, let me start with uh, just showing you a book uh, which is mentioned in the reference list that I have actually uh, sent to the organizer. So, uh, in the book, the title is Methods for Economic Evaluation of Healthcare Programs. So, this is extremely good textbook as well as a practical guide. So, uh, if you are really interested about pursuing your uh, uh, enhancing your understanding and pursuing cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis. Uh, uh, there are some chapters actually uh, you must refer to. So this is the book. Uh, uh, I, I'll request the organizers to uh, you know, uh, get the copies of the you know, relevant chapters. So let me start with uh, a brief overview. And you know, the cost effectiveness, uh, effectiveness analysis uh, is such a big uh, empirical exercise that uh, it's not feasible to uh, uh, cover the, the detailed steps in a uh, session of one hour. 
So what I'll try to do is I'll try to give you an overview of cost benefit analysis and the cost effective analysis. And I'm sure that once you have an uh, uh, introductory understanding about these two methods, you'll be able to uh, pick up any you know standard reference and you know and you continue your uh, uh, further uh, readings and research on that. So this is the title I have given: cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis. Now, what happened in the uh, the background of cost benefit analysis that uh, we know that we experienced a great depression in the 1930s and which actually forced the government to take up many public you know, programs, mostly to generate employment, you know, uh, to give wages to the people. So there are a lot of choice that what which programs to take up which can give the maximum benefits to the people, you know. So cost benefit analysis actually was developed as a uh, kind of tools uh, to select uh, a project uh, among the pro alternate projects that was actually available to the government. Now, because you need to justify uh, a particular project or program uh, to convince the to convince the, the parliament uh, and the representatives that okay, this is the most uh, uh, cost uh, uh, most uh, you know beneficiary uh, beneficial project in terms of generating benefits at least cost. So uh, these techniques continued and when Medicare and Medicaid were introduced in the United States in 1965, uh, the, the cost benefit analysis was one of the tools that was actually uh, used to justify uh, the, uh, you know, their introductions and benefits for the people. Now what this cost benefit analysis actually, uh, any project we undertake uh, definitely it's going to benefit people and it's also going to incur some cost. Now how to capture the different types of benefits and different types of cost? Take for example the construction of a dam. If you consider the, this is a very standard example of cost benefit analysis that when we construct a dam, uh, it has the immediate benefits that it will, uh, it will uh, control the flood it will improve the irrigation, uh, you know, uh, irrigation systems of the areas, but it will also have different direct, indirect benefits which will not so obvious when we take up a project. For example, uh, the all the water bodies actually, which will eventually actually promote the environment uh, uh, the, uh, in the long run. That's some. Uh, so there are costs, there are benefits like that which are not so obvious, but if you have a close look we can observe that any projects will have different types of indirect benefits. What are the cost? Of course, the cost of constructing a project, a dam, is so obvious, that's, a, that's something uh, one can observe. But you know, the construction of dam also involves displacing people, you know, it's destroying the forest. So there are different types of indirect costs which is not so obvious to, you know, uh, uh, that will uh, not come to everybody's notice, but those costs will be hidden, those costs will be uh, having a long term implications. So cost benefit analysis, what it does basically, it tries to incorporate uh, into the analysis different types of different types of cost and different types of benefits. Now, since cost, all the benefits are not in monetary terms, cost of, are obviously, most of the costs are in monetary terms, there are costs for displacing the people, so that something we cannot immediately convert into monetary terms. So cost benefit analysis actually, it suggests ways that how we can you know, value different types of benefits and different types of cost into a common units. Now the most <coughs> comprehensive or uh, acceptable uh, unit uh, can be money. And another important aspect of the cost benefit analysis is that the benefits and the cost actually they're not just uh, uh, for the particular year. So the benefits and cost continue. So we have to, uh, uh, you know, consider a kind of time horizon. So uh, the idea is that a project will improve social welfare if the benefits exceeds the cost, and benefits and cost include directly attributed to the project, and the indirect benefits and cost 
through the externalities and other third party effects. So Professor Chakravarti has talked about different kinds of externality uh, when he talked about the tuberculosis. So uh, the choice of a public program should be based on both cost and benefits. There's a need to assign common units of measurement of cost and benefits. And money is probably the most obvious choice for measuring the cost and benefits. And when we take up a big project uh, which affects the society you know, at large, we cannot just uh, uh, you know, uh, confine to our consideration to just uh, people who are directly getting affected by that. We have to take the perspective of the society. So all direct and indirect cost and benefits have to be uh, taken into account. Yes, I, I'll give the slides so you don't have to copy, I think. I'll just leave the slides with them. So the challenge is that not benefits can be traded in the market. Similarly, for example, Professor Chakorty was giving the example of the tuberculosis. The people who are getting indirectly benefited by this vaccine essence, you know, you they don't enter into the market. So you cannot go and charge them that you have also benefited by our you know, act of immunization, so you also pay some money. So you cannot do that. So there are people who are actually uh, outside the market whom you cannot directly charge. So there is no direct market for cost and benefits. So how, how can we assign mon money values to those cost, cost and benefits? That's something we have to uh, sort out. And then we have to uh, think about a long time horizon because these benefits are going to accrue for a long period, longer period of time. It's not just for next two, three, or four years. So there is an issue of how to, when, uh, how to, how, how one can treat the future. So uh, you have to discount rate. You, you have to use the discount. You have to discount the future benefits. I'll just come to, uh, I, I'll, maybe in the subsequent slides, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And uh, the, more, the most challenging part in this whole cost benefit analysis is the value values to their suffering. So these are the, uh, these are the challenges actually uh, uh, any, any uh, project uh, or public intervention faces. And cost benefit analysis actually suggests uh, ways to address uh, you know these challenges, and then you know uh, arrive at <coughs> uh, some kind of uh, common agreements about the benefits of the cost. Now, given this background uh, about the cost benefit analysis, now let me move to uh, move on to the uh, the World Development Report 1993, because uh, this report is considered as a milestone, which actually. Uh, used uh, methods which is very similar to the cost benefit analysis and uh, it uh, you know try to uh, give some kind of uh, you know uh, guidance or uh, <coughs> advices to the nations that how the nations can make their you know uh, priorities for the public health interventions or healthcare spending across different you know types of uh, government programs now, this is a report uh, uh, which was prepared by World Bank, and the focus was on investment uh, on health. So this is considered as a very policy, a very important and influential policy documents uh, in health. And this report made extensive use of two concepts. One is the disability adjusted life year, and the other is the cost effectiveness. So these are the two, you know, uh, concept I. Uh, the important, most important concepts that you you, you find throughout this uh, uh, you know uh, this report, and this report is actually downloadable. You know, you just go to the World Bank site and you just uh, you know, find the, the development report. So this is there's something easily accessible. <coughs> now, effectiveness. We all use uh, uh, effectiveness uh, as a common word in our uh, common. Uh, you know, Conversation, for example, uh, uh, my colleague told me that you know, for some chronic diseases, uh, he he finds that Ayurvedic treatment is more effective than you know uh, the allopathic treatment. So uh, when we use the term effective in our common conversation, 
what we essentially mean, probably uh, sometimes we mean that, okay, uh, uh, this treatment can completely cure the disease or we will not have to suffer, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have the side effects or uh, it gives me less chance of occurrence, reoccurrence re in the future. So when we talk about effectiveness uh, in our you know, common conversation, and if you look at some of the markers that we use, you find that they are mostly referring to the benefit sites. You know, it's not talking about the cost. Now, uh, at an individual level, when we talk about some kind of uh, treatment or some kind of uh, you know, medical interventions, I can afford to talk only in terms of the effectiveness or effectiveness, if, uh, uh, how effective it is or effectiveness, if I am sufficiently rich. I don't need to bother about the cost. But when nation or a country or a state takes up a particular health intervention, the nation cannot, according to the, you know, uh, the, uh, one of the arguments put forward by this report that a nation cannot afford to uh, talk only in terms of uh, effectiveness. The nation, when it chooses its uh, health allocation across different programs, somewhere it has to take into account the cost of that those programs. So it cannot only talk about the benefits. So this is very similar to the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis that the cost-benefit analysis talks about both the benefits as well as the cost. So similarly, the cost-effective analysis in terms of the benefits, it's talking about the effectiveness and then it's talking about the cost. Now, the, 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 the obvious difference between the cost-benefit analysis and the cost-effective analysis that cost-benefit analysis, we have the we have the compulsion to convert everything in terms of money. The benefits will have to convert in terms of money. The cost is obvious in terms of money. But cost effectiveness to analysis is less restrictive. You don't have to, you know, convert effectiveness in, you know, in, in terms of money. Uh, there can be other indicators which will be acceptable to people. And uh, the World Health World Development Report 1993 actually it it used the DALI, the disability adjusted life years, as you know, uh, it's, uh, as as a substitute of uh, 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 a substitute of the benefits that we find in the cost benefit analysis. Now, so <coughs> so this is more practical because cost effectiveness uh, analysis is less restrictive because. Uh, often, when you do the applied exercise, you don't have the compulsion to, you know, look all types of, you know, cost because cost-benefit analysis it's a public project, so uh, it has to take into account, uh, you know, different types of indirect costs. So some of the uh, some of the actually conditions are uh, relaxed in cost-effective analysis for a very practical, uh, very practical reasons. Now, so effectiveness is similar to benefits. So health gain is uh, uh, measured. It can be measured by uh, daily. It can be measured by quality, uh, uh, by quality. Now, quality is quality adjusted life years, and daily is disability adjusted life years. Now, quality was developed. Uh, quality was developed before. Uh, uh, quality, quality was developed in 1970s, and we find the applications of daily. That's the disability adjusted life years mostly from the you know early 1990s and uh, after uh, the world development report 1993 uh, the use uh, of tally became more uh, popular in the policy literature so <coughs> what is this tally uh, uh, first the tally is all about now it measures the state of health of a population uh, it's a quantitative indicator of burden of disease that reflects total amount of healthy life lost <coughs> during a period of time due to premature mortality and due to disability. And I'll, I'll explain step by step how, how actually uh, we uh, construct the daily uh, by taking, taking up a very simple example. Uh, uh, one can understand that uh, the cost is a less challenging aspect to handle because many of the cost uh, you can uh, really convert into monetary, you know, money values. But that's not the case for the benefits. That's not the case for the effectiveness. 
So, uh, Delhi, the construction of Delhi actually considers the five following important uh, uh, you know, uh, things, and there are some uh, social preferences, uh, some assumptions. So, duration of time lost due to, due to death at each age, disability weights, age weights, time preferences, and health is asset added across individuals. Now, I'll, I'll explain uh, what, uh, uh, what we understand by them. So, <coughs> Delhi is used to measure years of life lost due to a premature mortality or years of life gained by averting death due to intervention. So it requires defining potential years of life. So what is the standard years of life loss that are used? So they just look at the life expectancy at birth across countries and they found that the Japanese women, they are having uh, the highest life expectancy at birth at that time, which was 82.5 years. So anybody who is dying before that age is some kind of, you know, uh, uh, premature death and any persons actually suffering with some kind of disability they have classified some five types of disability and they have actually derived a scale you know how much value uh, you know if I am living one year with some kind of disability so what what is that value uh, should be should it be one or should it be less than one now if I am living one year of life with disability definitely my value of life should be less than one because less than one is the standard if they have made for the you know somebody's living a full year uh, life with a no disability so this is the standard now uh, disability weights degrees of incapability or sufferings associated with different non-fatal conditions <coughs> so it's necessary to make comparison across diseases and comparing time lived with disability with time lost due to premature mortality. So this is something uh, we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make uh, uh, the, you know, the living conditions of different people comparable. So they have, sorry, they have taken six kinds of disabilities and they have developed uh, a skill. So uh, it is done by the independent expert. So if somebody is uh, having a perfect health, normal health, so disability index takes value zero, and somebody is dying. That means disability is one. So this is the scale. The, the the two extremes of the scale is perfect health and death. And you know, living with any sort of disability, obviously the value will be between zero and one. So age weights. <coughs> so there is an age weight which indicates that relative importance of healthy life at different ages. Now, w, uh, the World Health Report 1993, uh, it uh, assumes uh, age weight function which rises uh, from your birth to the year uh, age 25 and then it gradually declines. So this is the functional specifications they have taken uh, for the age uh, weight, that age uh, minus weight some constant multiplied by h into exponential to the power raised to minus b into h. Now, I'm not uh, going to the uh, you know technicalities. There's something uh, that WHO, uh, the, the statistician and the, and the epidemiologist, they have uh, decided about the functional forms based on their you know empirical exercise. So, if you if you translate uh, this age weight age and age weight plot uh, uh, translate in, into a graph then this is something you uh, this is something is that uh, you see that we are measuring along the along the horizontal axis we are measuring the age and along the vertical axis that we are measuring the age weight so how much weightage we are uh, uh, giving to the uh, age that it reaches the maximum, you can see that it reaches maximum around, uh, it has, it's very, you know, steeply increasing uh, from the birth and it reaches its maximum around the age 25 and then it gradually increases and then the length actually has given till 
the maximum life expectancy at birth that was observed during that time, you know, the preparations of the report that was the Japanese women 82.5 years. So time preference. Now value of health gains today compared to the value of value attached to health gains in the future. So the the logic is that we have to you know we have to add all the benefits uh, you know sitting in the current uh, current point of time. So how how can we compare you know if uh, if uh, if uh, somebody uh, uh, if I'm 25 years, uh, if I'm at 25 years of age, and if I'm keeping, uh, you know, if I keep adding years to my life because of some kind of, you know, uh, health interventions or so, whether those additional lives should be added to my total, you know, uh, uh, years of uh, life with the same weightage. Now there. They say that uh, there should be some kind of you know discount that uh, that discount that we have to apply to the future uh, uh, future uh, uh, gain uh, in the you know uh, uh, life years. Uh, just given a small example. So if I uh, if somebody is uh, Somebody's uh, age is uh, increased from uh, 50 to 6, uh, 50 to uh, 51, and somebody's age is increased to uh, uh, 60 to 61. We assume that we are giving less weightage to that, you know, health gain uh, for the person who is uh, uh, getting 60 to 61, sitting in the current uh, time point. I, I may, uh, you know, elaborate this point at the time of discussion. Example. Now, discount fun there is a discount function that uh, this is something uh, discount function that is used in the construction of the dam. And if you look at the the graphical uh, presentation of this discount function, so uh, this is the way actually we uh, we uh, evaluate our you know uh, uh, future years of living. The starting point is the somebody. These three different graphs are that somebody is getting some, you know, uh, disability at the age of five. Somebody is getting at the age of 25, and somebody is getting at the age of 20, 45. So how the discount function actually behaving? If we extend the time horizon to the maximum, you know, the uh, length of life, uh, that is the expected life expectancy for the the populations which has observed the maximum value. Now, health is added across individuals. That's another, the last uh, assumptions we made, that uh, if two persons each losing 10 years of disability-free life, and one person losing 20 years of disability of your life, that's something we are assuming that it's, uh, it's uh, similar. Uh, we, uh, now, one may contest this assumption. They can say that, OK, two persons uh, you know uh, one person can say that we should uh, we should give uh, more weight to the person uh, if one single person is losing 20 years of life to the uh, you know and less weight to the per less weight to the uh, you know situation where two persons are uh, losing you know each 10 years of life so this different weights we can give you know if we have any disagreement uh, about uh, one person losing or two persons losing the same amount, but the assumption is that whatever weights we give, they we we can add we can add the uh, the loss of life years of different peoples, and we can get an aggregate figure for the you know country or for the society or for the community. Now, just to summarize, I'll. Uh, Delhi is an indicator of the time loss due to premature death, and it's a, also uh, an indicator which combines the time lived with disability. So, uh, the time lost due to premature mortality is calculated by using standard expected years of life lost with model type life table. Uh, 
uh, those of you who are familiar with the demography, you know that how the mortality rates are actually uh, you know calculated using the right table. And time lived with disability is calculated by disability weights and the discount function. And value of time lived in different ages calculated by wage weights. Now this is the uh, this is the formula actually uh, uh, that World Health Organization suggests for the calculation of Dali. So uh, the number of Dali lost at age X is given uh, given the onset of a disability at age A is given by this formula that Dali at X age at age X is D into C into X e to the power minus beta X into e to the power minus R X minus A. Now, if the person lives up to the maximum of his life expectancy with disability, we need to add add up the total daily number. So this is a this is a function uh, this is a functional form for a particular age. Now, if a person is so for for a person, we have a value a, x is an age. So we have value for each age, and when we you know add that person's actually daily values for different years. And we, we we get that you know the uh, that we get the total number of tally lost from H A to H at death A plus L. Now beta is given from outside by the expert. Uh, minus uh, the R is given from uh, outside. A is a parameter that when you are starting the disability, when you are actually first time experience, experiencing the disability. So. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example how we are actually uh, operationalizing this uh, particular formula. Now, how to calculate that? So, uh, let me just uh, take a situation where, uh, suppose uh, any health problem at any age uh, can uh, roughly result in the this four following possibilities. Uh, the persons can have immediate death, the persons will uh, uh, become disabled before death, uh, and the person can become disabled and uh, can live the rest of the life. Uh, uh, the person can become disabled before death, or the permanent uh, the person can become permanently disabled and live the rest of the life, or uh, the permanent the person can suffer for some times and then completely recover and can live a very healthy life complete, you know, full healthy life. So suppose we consider these four possibilities that any onset of a disease, yeah. that is the point. Yes, I, I, I'll come to that when I show you that part. Yes. start with a concrete example about a uh, female child who is actually getting this uh, uh, polio myelitis uh, at age 5. Uh, so that is the value of A at 5. The life expectancy is 82.95. So the remaining life after the onset of the you know, polio is 82.95 minus 5, that is 77.95. So assume the disability where it is so, uh, somebody living with polio is living half life. Suppose you may disagree on this weightage, but this just for a, for the sake of you know uh, developing the, this example, uh, let's assume that the disability weight is 0.5. That somebody living with polio is living half life. Now, uh, what can happen? She can die immediately. You can tell uh, you know you can uh, you can tell me. You know better about the, uh, you know, the various possibilities of you know, getting this disease. Uh, what what probably could happen to the patient? Now, let us assume that there are four possibilities. That the four cases I have mentioned. That she can die immediately. She can live another five years and die. She can be permanently disabled, but live the rest of the life. So this is the difference. The first. The two is actually she can live another five years and then die. Okay, that is uh, disability before death. So she will be disabled for some time and then die. 
and this is she is not immediately dying she is actually living the full life with the disability and the fourth possibility is that she can recover after a period of disability so these are the four possibilities that we are considering to actually develop our illustrations so let's the first case we remember this formula this complicated formula we remember and we see that how to calculate the last look at the last lines of this uh, you know uh, so this is this, this expression we need for actually calculating the you know the disable the, the, the daily loss because of the that uh, that polygon so what is the case the first case the daily loss due to immediate death so d is 1 because time our disability index we assume that full life is zero and you know death is one c this is something given by the expert it's a constant beta is again given by the constant you know the expert uh, 0.4% rate discount rate is 3% now a is 5 that's the person that the girl is getting the disease at age 5 so what is the remaining life if we sub you know if we uh, subtract from the, uh, the the maximum life expectancy and what so that is 82 point you know 82.5 uh, 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 minus uh, uh, the 5 it was not 82.5 but 82.45 i think uh, huh? 82.95 okay 82.95 uh, minus uh, 5 so 77.95 so we calculate the daily using this formula is this so if somebody is getting you know uh, uh, the disease at 5 and immediately dying so this is uh, the number of daily loss due to premature death is so daily sign is negative that's that means it's it's a daily loss so it's not daily gain it's daily loss so the the number of uh, you know uh, disability adjusted life years we are losing is 36 years now look at the sec look at the no no this is something given this is discount rate yes i have not calculated it is given it is given by the expert yeah okay so one reference is the world health you know world health report uh, and they have given this uh, you know uh, the world health report when in the technical appendix when they have given the formula for the daily and the cost effectiveness so you find a reference list in that so they have referred to the the who document so how you know who technical uh, You know, technical group has developed this uh, beta values and the, you know, the yes, yes. Here yeah, it's it's given to the researcher. Sir, is it different? I don't think that is different. No, I think as a discount rate, actually, it is uh, what we call exogenously given. But actually, there is no formula for uh, discount rate. What the researchers do actually for market instance, rate of interest. Uh, Market rate of rate interest, interest is one close to that, or otherwise, what you do, you do all the calculations with alternative discount rates and do some simulation. Which means that you take 0.5 as discount rate and then see what the daily is. You yes. then take 0.8 as discount rate and you know work out that and see what the daily is. So then your conclusion would be that okay, daily gain or daily loss will be something around this, within this range, depending on the rate of discount. So rate of discount actually the purpose of that is that since it's a future, so future you are discounting. Actually, you you really don't know how to discount it, but you should discount it. But we don't know exactly. So the discount rate is purely hypothetical. Yes, it's as a yeah. So we we it's just assume yeah we yeah we assume certain discount rate and then we go on calculating daily. So that's the that's the. It's the expert they all they agreed upon yeah. because. Because market rate rate of it, if you use the market rate of interest, it will be much higher than the three percent. But you see that that is what happened. On one of the study, actually they they took the rate at which World Bank gave loan to Bangladesh. Now that is sixteen percent. Yes. So, but here you see. So this is. Uh, so it varies like that. Actually. Maybe if you take a higher discount rate, it, it penalizes your future at a very high rate. So this is something three percent is you know very modest, yes. very low value. 
Yeah. Yeah, the so, philosophy is that philosophy is that how you discount your future. For instance, if I if I uh, for instance assume a very high discount rate for my future, then actually I don't count future much. I don't care about future. Yeah. But if you assign a very small number for future, which means that I do care about the future. So you say it's a varies from country to country. Yes, yes. 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 you are you are absolutely yeah. right. Before to the last gate, it was six percent and three six percent gate it was eight point five. I I want to know how the trend for three percent is three percent is good for India or we have to do more. Yeah, because because as I as I said, you know, it's somewhat close to the market rate of interest. So it, since in India actually it was you know somewhat lower interest rate regime now. So that's probably that's the reason that it's much lower. So compared to, for instance, Bangladesh or other South Asian countries, probably India's discount rate will be lower. So it's somewhat, you know, market rate of interest actually it says that it's reflective of your idea of future, you know. So yeah, I'm just going to discount it, but I'm telling you because I have read few papers in India that India will be around five point seven to five point five. No, what I understand is that you know uh, you can have different discount rates for different countries, but then in one country you cannot have different discount rates for different you know you know assessing the cost effectiveness of different programs. Because, yeah, so the beta, the beta and R actually they have to be constant across you know health intervention because then. You know, you are you, you will not be able to compare. You know, yeah. yes. That's why you have a proper friend, then you can use four sets of friends and be like this. Okay. So what do you mean that? I mean, actually, I mean that's that's what I suggested. In fact, ideally, a researcher, you know, if you if you ask me, what I would do is that I would question three point five or something. I would say that no, during this period of time in India, actually, I would go for point six. So, so I have to justify that. So, giving just a reference is not a justification. The justification is that how I come up with the number, right? So, if I have my own justification for my number, then I think that that's the reference. And what Sari is suggesting is that why should we use one rate of interest? You know, you can take up you know two, three, four different rate of interest and see how sensitive or you know. We have a there is nothing standard rate. No, there is nothing standard rate. Can we give you another example? I mean, this is not in healthcare. Actually, I did uh, some uh, uh, cost benefit analysis for a hydroelectric project in Kerala. We are looking at hydroelectric project. Okay. And there, in fact, you know, it is the Kerala government they assigned us that, that work. So, what we did ultimately is a cost benefit analysis. So, how do you discount the future? So, we gave alternative scenarios. So, if you take 8% discount rate, one scenario. If you take five percent discount rate, another scenario. So then we plotted the whole thing, and then we showed that if the government agrees with this particular rate of discount, then the project passes. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't. So I I leave it to the table, and then you decide. So this is this is one form of uh, app projection. Yeah, and similarly you can. Yeah, so towards the end actually we'll discuss that. I mean, I you know, this taking one single discount rate as a sacrosanct thing that actually completely derail your health program. There's nothing like correct rate. No, they have gain and that says you are discount at this rate. If you do something If you agree about that. So it 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 entirely depends on how you agree. So if the research community agree on a single rate of discount, fine. If I have disagreement with that, then it's not fine. No, they yeah. have a guidelines. Uh, if you look at discount, we have to use only three point five percent. Who's guidelines? It's nine guidelines. Nine is the uh, uh, National Institute of uh, some. Uh, it's the it's the organization which is 
if I have not a transistor, they give the guidelines to how much you put, they give guidelines for everything, but how to do it, sir? Okay, okay. guidelines for everything for researchers? I think that's something that is dubious, yeah. <laughs> they clearly say it's a discount use 3555. Except they only can they have their own guidelines. No, no, no. I mean, you, I think you, you, you need to make a distinction between government programs and how the government projects have to be evaluated. So if the you know Ministry of Health, Government of India, they give us a project and say that you do the cost effectiveness or cost benefit analysis, okay, assuming 5% discounted, I'll do that, right? But as a researcher, I will question that. So that's my point. So I make a distinction between. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, we have some time at the end, so we can pick up. You know, uh, by the time you can also remember the reference. Huh? Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, this is the next case. So disability uh, that 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 the girl lived for five years and died. So you can see that when we are calculating the daily for this case, we have two parts. We have to separately, uh, you know, calculate the disability, the uh, life years lost during the disable, you know, disability period, and then when the girl is dying, actually we have to calculate the disability, you know, daddy lost due to the premature mortality. So what is the disability part? Uh, so that's a b equal to 0.5, that we have assumed that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, the disability index with uh, this disease is 0 0.5. So we have the value of c, uh, beta, r, and a. L is 5 because the remaining life we are dividing into two parts 5 and then 72.95. So the daily loss due to the suffering of this 5 years is minus 2. So that's the since the uh, sign is mi minus 2, so it's a daily loss. And next stage the premature mortality part. The daily at age 10, we are again calculating and we are finding that it's a 36.85. So the total uh, total uh, daily loss actually is 33 point, uh, that is almost 34 uh, points. Now this way we can actually uh, discuss the other uh, two cases that when she becomes permanently disabled and when she can recover after uh, a brief sufferings uh, for some time. So uh, let's have this another hypothetical example using the previous example. That suppose we have a community of 20 children and all got polio at the age of 5. 5 died immediately. 5 died at the age of 10 after 5 years of disability. 5 became permanently disabled and 5 recovered completely after a disability of 5 years. So how how will you calculate the daily loss for this uh, 20 children who actually uh, went through you know, uh, different circumstances uh, due to this disease? So you just multiply uh, by the number and their respective uh, disability loss, uh, daily loss calculation and we and this is the figure we arrived at that almost 447 years disability adjusted life year loss due to this disease. Now, how do we calculate the cost effectiveness of an intervention? Suppose if there is no interventions or uh, so the cost is C0. Uh, then is uh, either there is no intervention or there is intervention, some intervention with the suffix uh, zero. So the cost is C0, Delhi is E0, and when we, uh, uh, you know, uh, through health program we make an intervention, suppose intervention 1, so the cost is C1 and Delhi is E1. So what is the cost effective ratio? That C1, so C1 is definitely higher than the C0 because intervention will have the cost, and the Delhi that the E1 will be higher than the E0 because now we'll have you know uh, less disability adjusted life years lost. So we take the ratio, uh, the incremental ratio between the you know increase in the cost and the increase in you know 
uh, increase in Delhi due to this intervention. So this ratio is actually uh, uh, considered as the cost effectiveness uh, cost effectiveness ratio. So uh, this is the summary points about about the cost effectiveness analysis. That's cost effectiveness analysis is based on cost and gains associated with the health intervention. We have we identify the appropriate health interventions and estimate their possible cost and potential benefits. So cost effectiveness analysis it shifts our focus from the individuals or groups to the interventions and for each disease category a range of interventions actually have to be identified now if you look at this book uh, uh, what is the current actually approach you know how do uh, how people actually uh, practically perform the cost effectiveness analysis now there are there are evidences on the effectiveness of different medicines or different health interventions from many randomized control trials. So, what is done actually, uh, uh, what is practically done is that you do the review of the evidence and you do some kind of meta analysis to assess the, you know, the, the, the daily or quality uh, gained of different kinds of interventions. You also get the information about the cost from the review of literature, review of the evidence. And that the meta analysis you use for you know deciding about the cost effectiveness analysis for your particular context so this is the way people actually do the cost effective analysis in practical situations so uh, many randomized control trials are happening you know across the world so you have to gather as much information you know evidence as possible you have to do the meta analysis and then you have to uh, you know uh, you have to uh, see the distributions of the uh, the benefits of different kinds of intervention and the associated cost, and then you make uh, your cost benefit, uh, uh, the, the matrix of the cost benefit, uh, cost effectiveness ratio. So, what this World Health World Development Report 1993, uh, they actually did, they uh, considered 26 major health problems and 47 interventions, and then they, they defined based on the cost effectiveness ratio uh, some kind of in essential health package now anything which was not falling in that essential health package actually uh, was uh, you know, considered as discretionary uh, discretionary and uh, they did not fix any you know they did not make any fixed cost effective uh, essential health package for a particular country so the philosophy was that we, the government investment or government intervention should not include, uh, uh, you know, uh, should not uh, include any less cost effective interventions by excluding a more cost effective intervention. So that was the, uh, that was the, the philosophy uh, that report actually followed. But it led to the country because the country is varied in terms of their disease transitions, you know, disease prevalence and uh, they are actually the, the, uh, their capability to fund, uh, you know, uh, fund, uh, resource for uh, uh, funding the health interventions. So they approved the country, but the philosophy was that uh, the country which are specially uh, actually suffering from resource crunch in the health sector, they should not include a less cost effective interventions by excluding a more cost effective intervention. So never include, uh, you know, you know, a cost-effective uh, uh, ratio uh, which is uh, high by excluding something which is low. Now, uh, as I said, that they left to the country where to draw the uh, you know, uh, line. Now, this is this is a very uh, uh, you know informative actually. Uh, the graphs they used for uh, uh, the countries they have considered, and look at this. The one uh, the along the horizontal axis they measured this uh, the cost for interventions uh, per year, and then they took this uh, the, in, you know increasing Delhi uh, in log scale because log was some kind of positive transformation because those diseases varied enormously in terms of dollar you know, daily gain. So just uh, keep uh, all the important and you know, uh, all these 47 uh, uh, 
this uh, uh, diseases uh, in the same graph they have uh, used this log transformation now uh, they give a this four examples can be uh, very illuminating that uh, take for example the uh, vitamin a sum, uh, supplementations so vitamin a supplementation in areas where the risk of blindness from vitamin deficiency is high and they found that this is a very low cost but high gain so it's a it's a uh, it's a kind of intervention is very you know it's low cost it's a cost effective intervention chemotherapy for tuberculosis it's a high cost but it's also very high gain the environment of control for dengue that's a low cost but also low gain and treatment of childhood leukemia that's a very high cost and moderately high gain now if you uh, just consider these two figures actually cited by this uh, uh, world development report uh, an expenditure of one hundred thousand dollar on chemotherapy for tuberculosis saves about 500 patients and prevents from others getting infected and they calculated that it gives around 35,000 daily gain so you save you know 35,000 disability adjusted life years by spending this hundred thousand you know dollar for uh, this intervention <coughs> chemotherapy for tuberculosis but if you make the same expenditure for the management of diabetes it only benefits 500 patients and saves only 400 daily with no indirect benefit so obviously the tuberculosis will have a negative externality so when you save a particular patient it also reduces the risk of other people who have not got the tuberculosis so it has got the indirect you know uh, positive externalities uh, uh, this intervention has got but for diabetes uh, you are only benefiting the people uh, the the intervention for diabetes will not you know uh, directly uh, will not directly benefit the other patients actually so you have obvious you for very obvious reasons that there is no uh, externality of health of your health interventions you have got you can you could only say 400 daily uh, with no uh, indirect benefits so daily gain is less than one per patient you can calculate that what is the daily gain for you know uh, for for one uh, for one person for the first case so these are the points actually i i want to skip and uh, now you know qual quali which actually uh, uh, a scale which uh, which was used before uh, the world uh, development report made tally popular uh, is little different from uh, quali but the, the idea is the same so uh, they use a weight to just uh, to, uh, to something that health related quality of life weight they attach to each years of life now this is i'm not going into the details of this formula so i'll just come to this uh, two examples that uh, yes so consider a uh, okay so this is something uh, quali is something with some modifications it's the, the the philosophy is very similar to Delhi uh, but we measure in terms of uh, you know utility by attaching uh, uh, the quality quality of life by attaching quality weight to each uh, added years of life because of the interventions now consider this example uh, now we are measuring instead of Delhi suppose we are using quality and cost uh, the exercise remains the same the cost effectiveness analysis now uh, this is an example i found in a medical journal um, uh, that the take for example a medical treatment for treating recurrent metastatic breast cancer so calculate the extra cost and quality associated with treatment with what is that called uh, doset axle dose axle yeah, those taxel compared with two other drugs. One is uh, Pacitaxel, and other is I think Vinor, uh, Vinoral B, Vinoral B. Okay. So I'm not uh, you know familiar with uh, actually what they are, but I understand that they are 
uh, uh, their uh, interventions in terms of uh, uh, medical uh, or the, the, the medicine uh, regimes. So this is, they have calculated that for uh, the docetaxel, the mean cost treatment per patient is uh, uh, this found uh, 7,870 and that acetaxel uh, is 7,645. So the, the difference in the uh, mean cost of treatment is 172. But when you compare the mean quality per patient is the difference is 0 0.0862. So this is, uh, if you calculate the what is the average cost per quality, you take the, uh, the, the ratio between uh, this figure and this figure, you arrive at 10,640. So that's uh, some kind of cost effectiveness uh, you know, ratio. And for the second medicine, uh, the, uh, you know, the second treatment, the cost uh, effectiveness ratio is 11,789. So, if you compare the, uh, you know, what is the incremental that the formula we have used that C0, uh, C1 minus C0 divided by, you know, uh, E1 minus C0, that's a 1995. Now, you consider another medicine that binaural uh, mean uh, with all these figures. So, you see the difference. Now, when, when, I, com when I look at the when I look at the average cost per quality, I I find that between these two uh, uh, you know uh, uh, these two medicines, this is more actually cost effective. This uh, docetaxel is most co you know, more cost effective. Uh, when you compare between docetaxel and vinodarone, uh, I find that uh, the second one is more cost uh, effective. If I just you know uh, look at the average cost per quality. But this is not something we do in you know cost effective analysis. It's we look at the increment, we take the not the average cost, but we look at the incremental cost and the incremental you know effectiveness uh, that ratio. So it gives a completely different picture. So here look at the difference that is 14,055 and here 1995. Okay, so this you know this becomes actually this still most effective that docetaxel if we focus on the incremental cost and effectiveness ratios but if you just go by the average cost uh, you know uh, cost per quality then definitely you arrive at a conclusion that uh, this binaural bin this is the most effective now uh, so it can it can give you uh, whether you focus on the average or you focus on the incremental you can it, it can uh, give you uh, it can give you two different conclusions two inferences but generally as a matter of practice we focus on the incremental now uh, there are reasons why uh, when we should use what is the what are the difference between the daily and quality and when should we use the daily when should we use the quality. Uh, there are standard references for them. I have included some of them, and a uh, uh, lot of uh, materials are available from the you know uh, uh, the web sources, and I, have, uh, I think I have given some. Uh, I can give to the organizers if they are interested. Now uh, I'll finish with some uh, important questions. Yeah, some uh, important uh, questions that uh, as if. Uh, uh, you know, as a medical, uh, as a doctor or as a public health uh, researcher or as a public health uh, expert or as a citizen, uh, and do you think that we should always go by the cost effectiveness analysis in deciding, you know, what kind of interventions we should actually go for? Because uh, cost effectiveness analysis just focuses on the incremental, you know, mostly the incremental cost and the incremental effectiveness, the benefits. And yeah, there are many other aspects actually which are equally important. For example, um, if you find that a large number of your you know population are getting affected by a disease, and the you know the, the treatment for disease is very uh, you know uh, the treatment for disease is very is having a very high cost effectiveness ratio. Should we just 
can we afford to ignore just by looking at the cost effective ratio because it can you know take us to the level of uh, uh, epidemic so so uh, the the thing is that uh, there are other aspects uh, uh, for the countries which are uh, going in you know earlier or moderate stage of business transitions where you cannot really uh, decide about the uh, health intervention just by looking at the cost effectiveness uh, you know, ratio another thing is that uh, uh, another point is that sometimes one intervention might you know uh, uh, might cost you uh, more if you want to if you uh, if you want to provide them separately for example um, uh, I happened to come across a paper where they are suggesting that the cost, the cost for providing chronic health care actually is very high and that, that could be the reasons that you know uh, 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 many of the facilities actually they are uh, uh, they are available at the you know uh, below the you know above the district, district and the above levels in the, you know. but there are certain markers I was told that there are certain markers of uh, you know, chronic disease that people can actually, uh, the doctors uh, sitting in primary health center or block primary health center, they can at least assess the, you know, some preliminary risk of the you know, chronic, uh, uh, chronic disease. So sometimes combining some, uh, uh, some diagnostic of chronic disease along with the primary health care, so if you can bundle them, so it can reduce the cost of providing some kind of chronic health care uh, you know, enormously and that will also be reflected in the lower cost effectiveness ratio. So um, another point is that cost effectiveness ratio uh, uh, cannot guide us in all situations because we also have to think, uh, take into account the perspective of, uh, uh, perspective of the society and its acceptability. For example, uh, there is a mention in a paper that for family planning, you know, uh, if we find some way, uh, a very cost effective, you know, methods for family planning. Now, we cannot really uh, practically implement that it is, if it is actually going against the, you know, conventional practice or the culture, you know, or the community's acceptability. So, uh, community's acceptability is also an issue, uh, why we cannot always, you know, blindly go uh, guided by the cost effectiveness ratio. And uh, there are some emerging diseases, so we have very limited evidence because as, as I said that how the cost effectiveness analysis is practically done is that you have evidence from many you know randomized controlled trials and you do the meta analysis and you know you uh, make your estimation about the effectiveness and cost and then you decide about the you know which intervention to choose but for emerging diseases you might be having very less evidence okay so and so when you have less evidence about the possible cost and you know possible damage a disease can make, then your your cost effectiveness effectiveness analysis will be based on a very limited information, which may not be, you know, which may not be the reality. And many emerging, uh, for many emerging diseases, many, uh, for which we need more research. So we need more treatment in the government facilities because uh, our experience suggests that, you know, those, uh, uh, for many uh, emerging chronic diseases that uh, the private uh, private facilities are so expensive so uh, even in a state like uh, Kerala a huge patient load for chronic diseases are actually handled by the public facilities not the private facility because the, they are so expensive to treat so to generate more evidence to do more research sometimes we have to intervene in health project uh, in, you know we have to make health we may, uh, we may have to make health interventions which are not very cost effective. Cost may be very high, but we have to make incur those high costs with very less effectiveness because just for the sake of research, we have to actually you know expand our knowledge about those diseases and even their possible uh, benefits. So uh, uh, I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. So materials, uh, some more links where you can find the guidelines and standard practices. Yeah.
questions we can take uh, that discussion session please to uh, invite uh, Dr. Rodinita Dawson to get up this session now. Uh, Dr. Dawson has been teaching the Department of uh, Economics in the City of Calcutta for quite some time now. And she is a very well known health economist. Uh, and uh, she has published quite a bit on uh, particularly issues of health economics in India uh, and uh, she visited a number of universities abroad teaching there. Uh, so she will take up this one hour session now and the session will end around one o'clock for lunch. and also uh, those who are uh, in the conference committee for inviting me and giving this opportunity to uh, share my understanding with you. I would uh, rather like to uh, start uh, that uh, start with the note that this is not a usual class lecture, I suppose, so it would be more interactive. I'm sure that in the last interactive session we will have more questions. but. Uh, uh, since we are, I'm going to talk about a little bit on the on a particular methodology. So, uh, if anybody has any question, immediate question, he can definitely ask because uh, it's uh, more on a methodology. Uh, now, as uh, we know that uh, since the last two decades, the a number of uh, policy interventions has uh, have swept the countries across the globe in terms of healthcare. So uh, in one uh, jargon that has become very uh, popular um, in the world now is the healthcare reform. And so what is happening that in different countries, in different forms, we are finding some kind of a reform in not only in delivery in services, but also in financing, in mode of financing, and also in uh, kind of monitoring that they are doing. So I give, uh, I suppose most of you are uh, mainly from India or uh, from uh, the developing countries. So uh, for example in India the National Rural Health Mission that has uh, been started in 2004, 5 So we have seen that not only there has been a change in the uh, nature of the service delivery. For example, uh, there has been a strength a effort to strengthen the uh, subcenter level, health subcenters, the lowest tier in the service delivery. On the other hand, there has been new methods of financing, like uh, performance-based finance coming for introduction of uh, accredited social health activists or ASHA. This is a kind of a new uh, arrangement because earlier what used to happen uh, that uh, it was this in case of uh, state financing, it, it, the state used to finance the line department, that is the health department. Health department used to hire the uh, providers like doctors, nurses, paramedics, etc. And they used to get a kind of a fixed salary, right? But with the performance-based finance for the ushers, what we start finding that they are receiving their uh, their uh, incentives based on what is the amount of services that they are providing. So how many institutional deliveries are taking place in that area? How in how many cases the ASHA is going there and staying with the lady at for the delivery? Everything is being coming as the incentives, right? So there has been a shift. Another major shift that has come here is the new forms, newer forms of public-private partnerships. So there has been a number of uh, new initiatives, right? So right, Janani Suraksha Yojana has been introduced in India for the last 10 years. Why the institutional delivery has not picked up in that way? 
so that yet your uh, in the West Bengal we find more than 30 percent of the deliveries still uh, today are being delivered at home. So if it is a kind of a conditional gas transfer and it is targeted towards the poorest uh, uh, strata of the population, then why still people are still delivering their babies at home? So that kind of a thing that comes under impact evaluation. That what has been the direct impact of a program that we are looking into it, right? So with this uh, preliminary thing, I would like to go with uh, this, that there are the social planner, when uh, normally it comes into play, that they introduces a number of programs and with a particular expected outcome. They expect this to be working in this particular way. Now, methods have been used to understand whether such programs would actually work as well as the label and the nature of the impact. So it's not just that uh, what has been introduced, but the question comes that what has been the, the actual impact, actual outcome. That becomes very, very important. And as I said, the Janani Suraksha Yojana was introduced to reduce the maternal mortality rate and also infant mortality rate. But still we find that India is off track in reaching the IMR and NMR both in terms of NDG goals. So that kind of a, a kind of um, questions that comes arise comes here, and especially this impact evaluation methodology has been actually uh, introduced and uh, supported by the uh, multilateral organizations like WHO, World Bank, uh, because. Now, you know, many of the public programs are actually being financed indirectly by the uh, multilateral agencies. So they, they are very curious to know that what is happening as a result of this. Because in most of the cases, when the reports are going from the governments, they find that yes, money has been spent, the, 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 the whatever mode has, was initially uh, understood, that has been followed. But yet, at the end, the result is not that promising that was expected. So uh, with that, the question comes with what does impact evaluation do? Now, programs might appear potentially promising before implementation, yet fail to generate expected impacts, as I said. And the obvious need for impact evaluation is to help the policymakers to understand that whether the programs are generating the right amount of impact and whether these measured changes will also need to uh, any further policy intervention, any change in the policy format. I give you one example for um, NRHM. Uh, when I was studying NRHM uh, at the very uh, grassroot level, initially for uh, utilization of the untied fund of the subcenter, the the signatories were used to be the ASHA, sorry, the ANM and uh, the, uh, the local PRI initially, the Pradhan of that uh, Panchayat. But then, due to the political disturbances, people found that, that Pradhan is not always cooperating with the system, with, with the government. So he is not uh, signing all those which has been for the utilization certificate, and hence, the district is not being able to put up their UC at the right time. So as a result, now the government, since it, they understood the problem at the grassroots level, so just with a uh, small stroke, it's changed the signatory from uh, that person PRI, it, it, it made any two of these will do, AM, uh, PRI, and the block level um, accounts officer. Right? So that is how uh, when the impact evaluation comes and when the results comes, the government also or the policymaker also can just adjust a little bit to improve the further uh, use of the new policy. Now, effective uh, impact evaluation should therefore assess precisely the mechanisms by which beneficiaries are responding to the intervention. This is very, very crucial that what the program is being implemented by a policy maker, but what is of utmost importance is that how the targeted beneficiaries, how they are reacting. Are they accepting it or they are not? Right? And what are the problems from the point
point of view of the beneficiaries. Also, there may be a question of the fact that beneficiaries do not know about the policy. They are not aware that they are supposed to get this kind of support from the government. So that's also a part partial failure of the system, of the policy, right? Now, broadly speaking, this causality, that from this uh, initial intervention, these things have changed. So this causality makes impact evaluation a very unique kind of a thing. And it is something beyond just uh, in evaluation or monitoring. Impact evaluation, it's just a little bit different from usual monitoring or usual evaluation, what is happening or something like that. Because we need to focus on that causality, that it is being done because of this policy changes. So that is very, very crucial. Now, the main question of impact evaluation is to call out the effect of the program from other factors and potential selection bias. Now, I introduce a rather a statistical term, selection bias. I will come to it later on to explain why uh, this becomes important. But selection bias, in a very um, non-technical way, it's something like that. That, as I said, that it was introduced in our region. Uh, the Jalani Suraksha Yojana was introduced. But what we found that some people are still not being able to avail herself to uh, access uh, the Jalani Suraksha Yojana transfers. Right? So there is a problem of self-selectivity. Whether I will select myself into the program, that is a big question. Right? So this becomes a very important issue whether when we need to call out the results, the outcome, from the other factors. We will find that there are some other factors as well. Right? Some other things are maybe changing. If we are looking at the entire last 10 years process, we also might say that since people are becoming more educated, more awareness is being generated, so this is not actually a result of NRHM. Rather, there has been the additional forces of improvement of education. So it's a kind of an education effect. So we need to call out those parallel things when we are looking at impact evaluation. Now the question is uh, whether it is going to be ex ante or exposed. Now ex ante is something, ex ante evaluation of the program often predicts the possible outcome and they do this by with the uh, help of certain economic model building, we can do that with the assumptions, with microeconomic economic theory, or even with the macroeconomic theory, we can develop a model so that we can think, see, if I do this and if I do that, then the result will be something like this. Or, in case of empirical analysis, we can simulate the data, depending upon the, say, last 10 years, uh, uh, experience availability of data, we can simulate the data and try to find out that if I just change this small part, then it is going to change the entire process. But it is all about prediction, right? So example uh, impact evaluation uh, depends on the predictions. But exposed evaluation is based on actual data get get gathering, either after the program in in implementation intervention or before and after program implementation. So what we normally use to think that it, it has to be comparing between a baseline and an end line, right? So in order to have some idea about the impact evaluation, we must have a baseline data that this was the initial thing before the intervention and this is the thing after the intervention. And we just compare, right? So it is one, it is one of the possibilities but in certain cases, we lack the baseline data. So what happens in that case, we do not have that much of a rich data on baseline, just we have the results for the end line. So after the intervention, what is the result? Right? Now, is it possible that we can use that kind of a data to find out, to call out the impact of the policy as well? So that is why I have used both the terms after programming in, in, intervention and before and after. Both the both possibilities are there. Uh, now, 
uh, if we ask directly what is impact evaluation, then it's the main challenge is to determine what would have happened to the beneficiaries if the program had not existed. So that is my answer, right? If you ask me in one word what is impact evaluation, we need to look at, we need to cut out the impact that what ha would have happened to the beneficiaries who now have actually been treated under the policy if they had not been treated. So in the, in the, uh, in, in the possible case that there was absence of this uh, program, what would have happened to the beneficiaries in the absence of the program? And there I compare between that possibility and the actual possibility that is happening to the beneficiaries after the policy. I will explain this uh, a little bit now. Because you know, this is a kind of counterfactual. We really cannot observe this. I, uh, with the help of WD Suraksha, I go to the nearest hospital and I uh, deliver my baby there. But had there not the Janana Suraksha Yojana, how would have I reacted? I cannot observe that. Without that program, I cannot observe what I would have done. I can ask the beneficiary that even without Janana Suraksha, had you uh, been able to go to the hospital? And she might say yes, she might say no. But that is not the actual response, you know, what would happen. And you know, social science is something which cannot be repeated as a um, experiment in the laboratory, right? So we do not have that data that what would have happened to the beneficiaries had that policy intervention not taken place. So that is why we call it to be a question of outcome action, which cannot be observed, right? and exposed, one observes the outcomes of this intervention on the intended beneficiaries. Does this change relate directly to the intervention? Not necessarily. So when I talk about that there, are, there is something else which is also possible, that this change, right? So in fact, with only a point observation after the treatment, it is impossible to reach a conclusion about the impact. So if I look just what is happening before and just what is happening after, it might be misleading. I will show it with the uh, graph soon. So the problem of evaluation is that while the program's impact, independent of other factors, can truly be assessed only by comparing actual and counterfactual <laughs> outcomes, counterfactual is not observed. So that is how we need to create the uh, counterfactual observations. We need to somehow develop the counterfactual observations statistically, which I cannot observe. Right? So that is my challenge. And therefore, finding an appropriate counterfactual is very important. Right? So if uh, the question that remains that, see, I, I am a beneficiary. I went to the hospital. Then somebody in my locality who is a non-beneficiary, though he, she had the chance of general selection, still she did not opt for it. So she basically self-selected herself to be out of the program. Right? And the question is, how close I am with her so that my observation after the policy intervention would be compared as uh, with the with her facts as my counterfactual, my control group, whether she can be treated as my control group. So the question that remains here that I need to find out a counterfactual who is very similar. In certain 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 um, features to me, but who self-selected herself to be out of the program, right? So, for example, I may question whether I stay in an urban area, whether she also stays in an urban area. I am educated till uh, the masters, whether she is also educated till masters. 
I belong to a middle income family, and does she also belong to the middle income family? I stay in a locality where I can reach the nearest health center within five minutes. Whether she also stay, it stays in the same locality. So these are my socioeconomic variables and other some of my other determining factors that has pushed me to go to the hospital. But something has put uh, that lady to she might have wanted to go, but she has not been able to go, right? And we have found, I'll come to it. So I'll first explain with the graph, that's why the symbol uh, ones are not, uh, why the simple comparisons between the treated and controlled groups are not always a good choice, why? So this is, say, this says evaluation using a bit and without comparison. I just compare between and impact, the, the impact between a beneficiary and a control, right? So what I'm doing, see, this is my end line, uh, sorry, baseline. So where the program starts, right? And from here, this is an example put forward uh, in the World Bank ha published handbook on impact evaluation. This is basically for uh, the microfinance impact impact of microfinance on the uh, Bangladeshi women. And you know, microfinance, Brahmin Bank is a kind of an institution all over the world. So what has been the impact of this microfinance policies on the income of the households who had opted for this microfinance? That was the question. Now, here you see that this is my control group. And this, sorry, this is my uh, participants. So they started initially from here, and with the microfinance, they reached here, right? Now, my control group who did not uh, accept the microfinance, they started from here, and they reached here, right? So if I just compare with and without group comparison, then the impact would have been this much, right? That's fine, but you see, there has been a major difference in the initial conditions between the control groups and the uh, treatment groups. So what is happening that the ultra poor, they are staying here. So they are from here, they are moving there. The question is, had the ultra poor not taken the use of the microfinance, where had they landed, right? So now I take use of this control group. This is my path followed by the control group. So here, from here, I go there. And my impact is actually this. So if I just compare the, at the end line, the uh, values between, or the outcome variables, between the those who took the policy and who, who did not take the policy, it would be missing it would not be able to call out the entire impact. Now, what about the before and after comparison? That was one between you with and without. Now this is before and after. See, what is happening from here, the, uh, the, the participants are reaching here. But the control group would have reached here because Something else might have changed as well. For example, what I was giving the impact of education. See, for a developing country in general, in general with time, the spread of education, the spread of awareness that normally improves with time. If, if not something drastic that takes place, right? So if I just look at the before and after thing, then I have reached here after the participation. I, if I could just compare this much, because I started from here, that would have been an overestimation of my uh, impact. Actually, without the policy, I would have reached here. So because something else has changed, right? And actual impact is here, this much, right? So the, this uh, issues have actually been uh, used now uh, to to create the control group, 
with statistical. So that is the you know uh, that is the challenge for the economists, uh, social scientists, and the statisticians. Now, an impact evaluation, as I said, is a problem of missing data, and without information on the counterfactual. Since I do not have the information on the counterfactual, what is the best thing that I can do? I can compare the outcomes of the treated individuals or household with those of a comparison group that has not been treated. This is very important that it has to be a comparison group. So if I just compare myself with a um, backward uh, class um, lady from a rural area, that is not going to give the actual impact. So I will have to find out a comparison group. And in doing so, one attempts to pick a comparison group that is very similar to the treated group, so that what would have been the outcome without this program, I can have an idea about this. Right? Now, uh, I'm not going to uh, much of mathematics, but just uh, with the help of a basic model, I just wanted to show that what is happening here. See, if the uh, outcome, if my outcome is Y, that is, uh, I'm looking, going to look at the impact of the program on the outcome Y, right? Now, Y I, I is the individual, I the individual, so Y I, if I can write this regression, uh, uh, regression equation is alpha xi plus beta di plus uh, uh, xi. Xi is the error part. Now xi is the other, as I said, set, set of other observed characteristics of the individuals, right? And what is d? D is the dummy equal to one for those who participate and zero for those who did not participate. Now, this is the normal wisdom that I would run this regression. I try to find out whether this beta is significant and which, what is the direction of that beta. If that is a positive significant, then we can say that treated group actually have a better outcome than the non-treated group. But there is a major problem in this regression. What is the major problem in this regression? That is called the sample bias. I'll just um, talk about the sample bias and come back to the regression equation once more. Now, the problem with estimating equation one is that the treatment assignment, that is the value for D, one and zero, is not often random. And it depends on the purposive program placement, Maybe some of the some of the uh, programs are targeted for some specific group of people. Say, as we know, Janani Suraksha is basically targeted towards the uh, poorest people, um, SCST people, and also uh, for uh, having babies less than two. Right? So it's a targeted program. So it's not always targeted for all. And as I said, there is a problem of self-selection into the program. Now, who turns self-selection given program design and placement? That becomes an important question. The results of Janadis Raksha, what it suggests that utilizing maternal health care services would depend on a lot of socioeconomic parameters of the household. There has been a number of studies a number of studies now which have tried to point out that what are the barriers for utilizing the general Suraksha. Why is all the people are not utilizing the general Suraksha? Why institutional delivery is still taking place in the uh, at home? And what are the basic uh, determinants that overall most of the uh, literature has found? Education of the woman not only education of the woman, but also education of her partner, right? So that becomes very, very important because plus, uh, at some field studies we have found that the lady is willing to go because she is aware, because Asha and AM have come to her and they have actually made her aware about the need of the ID. But the decision-making power within the household 
has been lying with her husband or partner or even in certain cases with her owners. So she is not being allowed to go there. So it's not just the lady's own uh, uh, you know, education, but also her partner's education. Religion, caste. Now there is a big question mark on this because uh, those who are interested in that have a look on the WHO uh, report on uh, Commission on Social, uh, Social Determinants of Health. The question is whether certain social uh, characteristics determine the healthcare utilization and the healthcare status, or is it actually entirely working through the economic conditions? So, is it like this that in our country, in some of the states in India, the Muslims are not allowing their uh, their wives to go for institutional delivery? Or this is there is nothing of the religion effect. It's actually working through its nature of economic conditions. That in some of the cases, Muslims are the poorest in, in our population as well. Whether the ASTs, the Shinul tribes, are not availing certain uh, uh, healthcare uh, utilization, healthcare services because they do not have trust in that or because they stay in certain remote areas where the access to the health services are not there. So these questions are coming up and unfortunately what ha whatever has been uh, come up uh, in the literature, we still really find that particularly in terms of health care utilization, this kind of ethnicity, that matters a lot. Even given the economic condition in the control variable, we find that there has been certain ethnicity uh, bias for healthcare utilization in most of the developing countries. I would not say developing countries in general, but also most of the developing countries. And also, this is not something which is completely absent in the developed countries. We also find in the United States, the black uh, community, the white community, and the Asian Hispanics their healthcare utilization, some are different broadly in spite of the fact that they are coming from the similar educational and economic backgrounds. So that is important. Economic condition and standard of living, that again is very important, standard of living, whether the, lake, the, the household has sanitation within the house, whether the, um, the household has access to proper drinking water, the, uh, whether the household uses the green chula or uh, like uh, a very uh, you know, strong uh, uh, biogas or something like that. What is the source of energy for cooking, etc. Distance to the nearest health center and availability of the transport system. So we have found that for obvious reasons, all these cases, you know, all these variables that have been very, very uh, strong determinants whether the lady should go for the institutional delivery or will deliver the baby at home or not. So all of them are very important. Thus, even when all women are given this incentive, they self-select to avail the program or not. And hence, D in the equation 1 is not independent of all these. I go back to my equation so for a regression equation, if this is a kind of a normal uh, regression, OLS, or in the, the limited dependent variables, what we assume that all Xi's and Bi's are independent of each other. But that is actually not taking place. The fact that whether the lady is self-selecting into the program or not will actually depend on Xi's, on the entire set of Xi's. So if I just run this regression in my with my data, it might not give me that choice. Right? Okay. Uh, so the average treatment effect is actually uh, the if if I uh, say y y one is the out uh, y one is the outcome of the treated individuals and y zero is the outcome the non-treated individuals, right? Then average treatment effect is about the 
decompose expected uh, value of the changes in in y given that the person is being treated t is equal to 1 so essentially if if i break it down it's like e of y1 given this this line means given uh, given uh, d is equal to 1 minus y0 d is equal to 1 now see, y0 is observed for those who are not treated. That is for d is equal to 0. Right? So therefore, expression A can be estimated from the sample observation on the targeted groups. But the expression B is not observed here and one needs to define suitable approximations. The second one, B is not observable. Right? Uh, if all the units in the population would have the same probability of being selected, then this would have been fine. You know, there would have not been any change. But the typical non-random sample problems lead that for certain households, it's, there is no chance of being selected into the program. Right? And so, the important thing is average treatment effect on the treated. So essentially, I'm looking at this is ATT, is the average treatment effect on the treated, right? So this is E of YI1 minus YI0 when WI is equal to 1. And that's, that isolates those who are likely to participate in the program. That is very important that who are participating. So if I want to have a kind of impact evaluation to call out the impact, I first need to find out that who are availing this policy, who are taking advantage of this program, and why. Why this person is availing herself for the, this program, and why somebody else is not availing, right? So that becomes very, very important. Now, there are different methods for uh, doing this. I will just introduce one method, and that is propensity small matching. There are certain others like difference in difference. There are certain others like IV method. But I will here talk about the propensity score matching. What essentially I do here is that uh, propensity score matching constitutes a statistical comparison it constructs a statistical comparison group that is based on a model of the probability of participation in the treatment, uh, uh, here I have written T, conditional on observed characteristics of X. And that is my propensity score. So what is the propensity that I, as a person, will avail the program? And what is the propensity that somebody else will not avail the program. So for each individual, I am calculating that propensity score. What is the possibility that I will actually do this? And I, I, I write this as P of x, the probability of t is equal to 1 given the x. Given the x means given his other socioeconomic factors and maybe other uh, factors like where the household is located, whether it is near certain things or something like that. Right? Now, what we do, that samples of participants and non-participants are pooled, right? So, I, when I do this kind of a thing, I will just uh, give you also a glance of uh, one of my uh, very recent work where I have done, uh, used this propensity score matching to give, a, give you an idea about how to move about, but that's uh, later. Uh, what I actually do, the samples of participants and the non-participants, I put together, right? And then, I try participation T should be estimated on the observed covariance of X, right? So I try to find out that what are the possibilities for me to go there and avail the program. And after the participation equation is estimated, basically what I am doing, if I go back to this equation, here I do not use this part. 
I just use yi is equal to alpha xi. Right? I just regress it. I'm trying to find out the p hat, the propensity p x hat. Right? And after the participation equation is estimated, the predicted values of t from the participation equation can be derived because once I, I have estimated for all the betas, then I can put the values of xi for individual household and I can calculate the value for y, which is the left, left hand side. And this is this we call the estimated value and the pred or the predicted value. Now the predicted predicted outcome represents the estimated probability of participation or the propensity score. This line is very important. The predicted outcome represents the estimated probability of participation or propensity score. Now every sample participant and non-participant will have an estimated propensity score. I have done this for the entire set. Now I compare. Right? Now I compare the propensity scores of two similar individuals are matched. This is a very interesting kind of a thing that how we match, right? So what I do, I can, I have an option of choosing the nearest neighbor. Say for example, my propensity is 0 0.01. There is another person in this group who is non-participant whose propensity score is 0 0.012 and that score is the closest one to my 0 0.01. So I am being matched with that person. Right? I calcul they calculate the statistically, I calculate the difference in the propensity which essentially gives me an idea about the impact on the output. Right? So a positive or, or negative impact is calculated between the treated group and the control group. So basically what we used to do earlier when I used to compare between the treated and the non-treated people, we used to take the average of the differences. Here we are taking differences first and then making the average. I am taking the difference between me and the person that is the difference between P pro propensity score of I person and the J person. I'm taking that difference and I am then making the mean for all this. Right? Now I'm going for an illustration. Uh, I actually was looking for what kind of work has been done in the recent uh, uh, Indian literature on the healthcare and also on impact evaluation. There are a number of studies that I could found um, uh, in uh, particularly the journals like health policy and planning, uh, social science and medicine, something like that, international journals, but none of them were actually on India. Some of them were on Ghana, some of them were on Iran, so they were trying to find out that what has been the impact of certain program or something like that. So that is why I uh, and I also thought that because of time constraint, I will not be able to say two uh, evaluations uh, simultaneously. So I am just giving you an illustration which I uh, finished almost uh, just a few days back. This is actually about the fair price medicine shops, uh, which has been introduced in uh, West Bengal, which has been uh, uh, done uh, in the, for the last one or uh, two years now. And basically, uh, since I, I am addressing a gathering with, where most of them are uh, public health professionals or doctors, uh, I think you all of us know that one of the major source of out-of-pocket expenditure in the developing countries is medicine. And the NSSO data of several rounds has pointed this out. And uh, this has also resulted in significant catastrophic expenditure on the household as well. So it was basically this fair price shops, what they have done that they, they have created the medicine shops within the hospital premises. But this has this is being run by private parties. So it's not that the government is running these shops. This has been auctioned with an internet open uh, bidding that who will be giving the maximum discount and the 
the only investment on part of the government is that they are giving land to within the within the hospital right now you uh, will definitely we can raise this question that is this a first best policy because there are other states like rajasthan like uh, delhi like tamil nadu who are trying to ad uh, address this issue by improving the supply of the hospital drugs through the hospital policy so they are streamlining their supply chain management they are looking at their essential drug list something like that this is something which is completely different from what is being done it is not going through the free chain of hospital but it is being offloaded to a group of a chain of pharmacists and since most of them are quite renowned pharmacist chains so maybe the question of quality is not very strong however i am not going to comment much on the quality of the medicines because i personally belong to a social science uh, street who is not actually uh, you know equipped to comment anything on the pharmacological uh, quality of the drugs so basically uh, this is an output based contracting out my output is the medicine that the shops will be uh, uh, selling they will 142 mandatory basic generics and uh, there is a type of branded generics generics and branded generics medicines which has to be uh, provided as i said this is a ppp code on 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 the top of this these hospital these uh, pharmacy chains are providing some user charges to the government every month so there is minimum investment from the exchange that is there right okay now moving on to some quick facts and figures that so far we have 94 um, uh, fair price medicine shops uh, till november 30 and their discount is ranging from an unbelievable 48% to 77% now how they are going to give offer this kind of a huge discount is a completely different question that i am not going to address here because it's an economic question and um, i have an answer to that but i'm not going to discuss it here i'm just going to focus on the impact right okay. now with this uh, in a commission study uh, we wanted to have a look at the entire process with specific impact evaluation of the scheme on the out of pocket expenditure right and a study of 1000 in patients and 1000 out patient uh, yeah, from different hospitals were uh, surveyed and what we found that in the in patients those who needed to buy medicines from outside see we found however a, a, a significant amount of people who did not need to go to the uh, outside hospital as well there is some uh, say uh, it was probably around 20% who received all the medicines from the hospitals this is higher in case of outpatient departments right so those who needed to buy right out of them 56.7% actually went to fps rest of the people they did not go to the fair price shops right so here comes the question of self selecting so are all of them needed they had to go out and they had to buy medicine from outside but a significant proportion almost half you know this is not very really small amount they did not go. they opted to go outside the retail the in the outside retail retailers so we first need to find out what are the variables which determine this possibility of going as i said i need to find out what are the the determinants and the of being self selected in the process and that also i will immediately that will give me an idea about my propensity score right so i use a probit model now before going into probit model this is a summary statistics the description now what the first group is for the treatment is taken and the second one is treatment not taken out of pocket medicine right this is not for the entire year this is only for this episode right 
So what would I expect? I would expect those who were treated, that is who went to the FPS, their out of pocket should be less than those who, are, who were not. Unfortunately, what we find, the treatment taken is significantly higher out of pocket in both IPO and OB. Right? Now, does that actually mean that impact evaluation has been completely negative? and there has not been any impact whatsoever. If we conclude from this stats, we would be wrong. Because we do not know what prompted those to take the treatment and what prompted those not to take the treatment. So we go forward with this uh, probate model, and this is, I, I know, small uh, fonts. I will just focus on some of them. The, just look at the colored uh, cells. They are my significant variables, right? So we have certain hospital level variables, hospital dummy variables, department level variables. Now, here you see the non-poor, with respect to the poor, they go more to the FPS. So that means the ultra poor, they are not available, right? Now, I have earlier morbidity. Whether the household has suffered from earlier morbidity in the same year, so that there has been an already uh, significant out of pocket for that household. That has been significant. Access to newspaper. Understandably, most of the um, advertisements came in the newspapers, right? So, access to newspaper. And this is important the logarithm of length of stay, right? So how long they stayed in the hospital? This actually gives you an idea, a proxy about how difficult your uh, mobility is. There was a question mainly asked by the doctors that how can you compare two people, a person who is coming with a fever, two persons coming with a fever, somebody can have, can, uh, may be coming here with a fever because of a very, very serious illness. And the other one is just a cold and cough. So I, I cannot, compare that with the help of those medical journals. I am not equipped to do that. So I took the, that is a standard method also. I took the length of stay. How long did the patient stay? And lastly, the generic share in the prescription. You know, uh, I know that uh, many of you are actually uh, a part of the government hospitals uh, in West Bengal, so you know that in the last one and a half year there has been a pressure, a pressure on the doctors to write the medicines in the generic names. Now, what is important here that if the doctors write in the generic names, then the fair price medicine shops holders they can give you any brand or branded generic of the same uh, generic, right? So if, understandably, if the generic share is higher, then they will go more to the FPS. So if I have this, and I, I next I compare the, uh, what we call the common support. So is there enough common support so that I can find control groups for most of my treatment? And it came out um, very well, actually. I had 808 population, total in the sample and out of them 801 was used so the po possibility of uh, the, the sample lying outside the common support is just 7 out of 807 so it's very low and uh, I'm not going to further. This is the how it looked the common support. If you run the, uh, the program in data this kind of thing comes and it shows that actually those who are like outside the common support is very low, right? And so this is my impact evaluation result. See, this is the unmatched. And what was it we had found that treated had more uh, out of pocket than the control. This was positive. But after I, I matched with the average treatment for the treated, I found that this is a negative one, which is significant at 5%, right? Similarly, this is for total medicine cost, and this is for total medical cost, not just medicine, but the other medicine cost. There was also a significant reduction. 
I just showed the out of pocket uh, figures, sorry, uh, the uh, inpatient figures. For the outpatient figures, automatically the values are smaller because it's just one episode coming and going, right? So there also, the, the, it is negative, but it is significant only at 10% level, not at 5%. Okay? So with this, actually, if I just go back to my pictures that I had initially. So this is the outer pocket of medicine here. This is my program with time. This is the participant. Actually, those who needed more medicines, who wanted, needed to have more medicines for a longer stay in the hospital, they went for their kids, not all. So, they, here starts the participants, and here is my participant, participant after treatment. Control is here. This is control without treatment. So, if I just compare after the, the treatment issues, participant and the control, this would have been positive. But actually, what happened that the participant without the uh, uh, program would have landed actually here. This is parallel. See? So, this is my impact. This is my counterfactual, and this is my impact. Right? So, that is how we look at it. And so, finally, what we can say in short that impact evaluation is a specific methodology that can be used to identify a tangible change in an output coming from a policy, but conditions might differ at actual site. What I found here in FPS may not be the true for the other policies as well. If you look at the Ghana case, you will find that something else, some other factors were more important, right? So you will have to choose the, the method which we will have to use, whether it is PSM, whether it is difference in difference, with some methods. I have to know which method is to be used. I just gave you an example of PSM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we break for lunch. And, uh, and uh, the topic that I am going to present here now is measurement and determinants of health status. And uh, I will be referring to child undernutrition as <coughs> service C. So uh, now uh, this audience I think is very familiar with this uh, very basic concept. But just let's go back to the basics once a brush up. So uh, nutritional status is uh, usually uh, studied with reference to anthropometric measures now. Uh, instead of using the calorie-based measures, uh, particularly for children, these are the most commonly used measures. And according to the Waterloo classification scheme, we have these three uh, very common forms of uh, undernutrition indicators. The first being stunting, which refers to low height for age. And uh, this is an indicator of long-term or cumulative uh, health of the child. And wasting is a low weight for height, which uh, is an uh, indicator of current health status, the child's health status in the current period, whether there have been uh, any exposure to health shocks um, in the past few weeks. That is reflected in the weight for height of the child. And underweight is the composite measure which uh, uh, takes into account both these factors. It's a summary measure which is uh, used by international agencies for uh, comparing uh, the performance of different countries or even states. Now, uh, these anthropometric um, uh, scores are expressed in standard deviation units or z-scores from the median of the reference population. I'll just speak uh, briefly about these before entering into uh, the debates. Uh, because this is very important, that is, uh, the 2006 uh, growth standards, as most of you would be knowing, are growth standards as opposed to growth reference, because uh, this is based on the set of children who um, grow in ideal environmental conditions, who are exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life, and whose mothers are non-smokers. So the way these children are growing is actually how the world's children in all populations should grow. So uh, that is should grow, not actually as they grow. 
uh, as opposed to the previous growth references used by who in 1995, which was based on American children who were uh, formula fed. So that was how those children were actually growing. So uh, this is, um, as I'll come to it in the next slide, that though there is some room of debate even now regarding the acceptability of these standards in different countries, uh, but overall there is a consensus on um, uh, the use of these standards. The children, people, uh, nutritionists and uh, health economists and people who matter all over the world do agree that this is how children should actually grow. So uh, now the z-scores follow standard normal distribution. So 99% uh, of the population lies between minus 3 and plus 3 and 95% between minus 2 and plus 2. So uh, naturally we have two cutoffs, minus 2, uh, referring to uh, those children who have z-scores below minus 2 are moderately undernourished and those with uh, z-scores below minus 3 are severely undernourished because at 1% of children of the reference population would be below minus 3. Now uh, we come to measuring undernutrition. Now, though I'm referring to undernutrition here, uh, this can be general. This is actually generalizable to other indicators also, other health indicators also that are uh, measured in terms of certain cutoffs, binary or maybe that uh, divides the um, and classifies into three classes or four classes. In all such cases, this analysis would apply. Now, uh, following Amor Toshin, we um, can say that uh, measurement, uh, such a measurement exercise that is measuring undernutrition would be uh, com consisting of two steps. First is identification, that is who are the undernourished children. So that's what I've already uh, covered, that is those who are below minus two or minus three are undernourished. And though this is often debated, even now in 2013, there was a fierce debate about whether these standards are actually applicable in the Indian context or not. But uh, people more or, more or less have agreed on the acceptability of these standards. Now the next step would be to form an aggregate. That is, what is the number of undernourished people? The number is not the actual number, may not be the actual number. That's what I'll ar argue. That is, uh, now see, aggregation would be, see, we have these undernourished children, they have been identified as undernourished. But now if I want to present a picture of the undernutrition situation in different countries, for example, then how would I say what is the total figure? Now the figure would be the simplest head count ratio, that is I count the children, that's one way. But now see if there are two situations okay now this actually when i was working on this we drew parallels from poverty measurement now so we have a poverty line income uh, that is fixed say rupees 100 okay this is just an arbitrary number say rupees 100 is the poverty line those who have incomes below rupees 100 are poor that is accepted somehow just as we have the minus two or minus three cutoff in case of undernutrition now Suppose there are two countries, country A and country B. Now in country A, uh, there are say, now the total population is also same, let us assume, for simplicity. And in country A, sub, and the poverty line is also same. In both countries, rupees 100 is the poverty line. Now in country A, suppose 90% of the poor have incomes in the bracket of, say, 90 to 99. So there are the poverty poverty picture is how how is it reflected? That is poverty is 90% because 90% of the people are having incomes below 100. Now in country B maybe 90% of the population has income below rupees 20. This is a very stark difference that I am saying for example. But in the two situations are definitely not same. Intuitively it is understandable that the two situations are not same. But if I count, if I go by the head count ratio, the simple proportion, then this is not reflected. This is the point that Omotoshen raised when he was formulating his poverty measure. Okay. So his whole point was that depth is important. It is based on the notion that depth of poverty is important. Not just counting the poor, but how far are the people from the poverty line. This is not reflected if I go by the head count ratio. Same in undernutrition. It's just parallel. If in our thought exercise, we can consider another example where there are two situations like this. So those are not similar. Now, 
Professor Shin, when he was um, conceptualizing his poverty measure, he um, formulated certain axioms of poverty measurement. Now, uh, the most important of it, most uh, fundamental that would have its uh, relevance in the case of undernutrition also, is the first action, that was the monotonicity action. To state it, put it in very simple terms is that the worsening of the condition of a poor should somehow be reflected in my measure of poverty. That is, if a poor person gets poorer, then my poverty measure should increase. And how did he justify it? The justification was that of relative deprivation. That is, his point was, he drew on Ruth Sivan's notion of a relative deprivation. That is, people who are poorer have a greater feeling or sense of poverty. So, the poorer I am, the greater is my feeling of poverty, greater is my sense of poverty. So, this somehow needs to be accounted for. How can it be accounted for? We take the shortfalls. This is in the case of poverty measurement. The income shortfall was taken and the greater the shortfall was, instead of taking a simple average, a weighted average was taken and greater weights were attached to the greater shortfalls in order to pay heed to this greater sense of poverty. Now when we draw a parallel in the case of undernutrition, intuitively we do understand that the gap or depth is important. But how do we justify it? We cannot draw a parallel when we intuitively justify it in the sense of greater sense or feeling of undernutrition. Definitely that makes no sense. So how would we do it? What we have done is we have uh, made an extensive survey of the biomedical literature which you will be much more familiar with than us. Uh, and we have come up with this finding that the greater is the shortfall from the nutritional cutoff the more severe is the physiological outcome, the direr are the consequences and the direness increases at an increasing rate. That is, outcomes worsen at an increasing rate. So this was our justification of using greater weights for greater shortfalls. So what we argue is that instead of using uh, just the headcount ratio or the proportion of undernourishment which we find in the literature or in policy documents that India's um, uh, proportion of undernourished children is 40, underweight children is 43 percent, that of uh, stunted children is 48 percent. We do not dismiss this, this is very important. The proportion itself is very important, it is one thing, but this is another thing. That is when we form an aggregate, we need to pay heed to the depth as well. So we formulated a measure that these are the biomedical findings, um, which as I said, you all of you must be knowing these. So based on this, we conceptualized a measure of undernutrition like this. Now, uh, this is actually the very frontier literature. Many uh, recent studies have been using measures like this. What we are doing is C minus 2 is the cutoff, and Y, I suppose, is the nutritional score of, a, of the ith child. So the shortfall is the difference. You know, we normalize it. Okay, I'll come to it. It's called the mean of square deprivation gaps. Now, uh, what we are doing is, this is actually the measure that we conceptualized um, and many recent studies have been using uh, nutrition measures parallel to those poverty measures. Now, uh, what we are doing is, uh, the, we, we are taking the depth of uh, undernutrition, that is, if Yi is the anthropometric z-score of the i child, then we are taking the deviation from minus 2 and we are dividing it by minus 2 again, I have missed the minus sign. And then to form an aggregate, as I was saying, we need higher weights for greater shortfalls. Now uh, we use the shortfall itself as the weight. What, what is the weight that we can use? We are using the shortfall itself as the weight. This is one way of um, looking at the problem. We can use other weights which are increasing at an increasing rate. Since the shortfall, the, if we use the shortfall itself, then with greater shortfalls we are obviously having greater weights. So we are squaring this gap and we have the mean of square deprivation gaps. This is analogous to uh, a very familiar measure of poverty called the FGT2 uh, measure of poverty. It is the, uh, a class of poverty measures that we don't need to get into the details of this. Now such a measure using a measure like MSDG, the mean of square deprivation gaps. Why is it called mean of square deprivation gaps? Because we are just squaring the deprivation gaps and we are taking the average. We are dividing by n where n is the total sample size of children. Now, uh, it satisfies a very useful property that it is subgroup decomposable. That is, if there are five groups in a society, suppose I have five wealth classes, I have five wealth quintiles. 
Now, uh, children. Actually, children are divided into five classes according to household wealth. Now, if I calculate the MSDG of each group, and then I take a weighted average of those group MSDGs, weighted by the population share of each group, that is 20% in this case, if I have each class size of 20%, then I will have the MSDG of the total population. So this is a very desirable kind of property which we use in certain analysis. Now, um, what we are saying is that instead of focusing just on averages, if we use such kind of measures which are satisfying such desirable properties, uh, now as we can see, uh, one uh, in, in the context of poverty it was shown, let us look at this formula that is U uh, W Z star is equal to H into G square plus 1 minus G whole square into C U square. Now this was derived in the context of poverty, but it is applicable here also. See, what it is saying is that H is the head count. It's a simple average. Okay. G is the poverty gap. In our context, it is the undernourishment gap, the depth. And CU squared is the squared coefficient of variation of undernutrition among the undernourished set of children. So what are we having here? If we have a measure like this, it is reflecting the level as in H, just the head count, then G is reflecting the depth and CU squared is giving me the inequality in the outcomes in the nutritional status of children uh, who are undernourished. So what we are actually capturing is the severity, not just the gap but also the severity. So this is a kind of desirable measure. Now when we calculate uh, the figures for Indian data, Using the third round of uh, National Family Health Survey data, we calculated uh, the MSDG values for the different states. And what we came up with was that you see, uh, we have the 15 major states here. And the first column is giving us the total proportion of underweight children in a state, as given by the NFHS 3 report. And in the parenthesis, we have the state ranks. And the second column is giving us our measure, that is mean of square deprivation gaps. And we have the ranks in the parenthesis again. So what we can see is that there is a strong positive correlation between state ranks according to average underweight, according to headcount, and according to our measure. These measures do not uh, on average diverge very far. But only three states retain their ranks and there is certain kind of difference in the performance of states depending on what kind of measure we are looking at. Is it the simple average or this composite kind of measure which takes into account all those dimensions. So we see that um, there are certain states like West Bengal and Orissa which perform better when we use the MSDG instead of the simple headcount ratio. Whereas again there are certain states like Andhra Pradesh and Assam where we find that these states are doing worse when we use the MSDG rather than the headcount ratio. Now what does this mean? This means that although maybe in terms of average undernourishment, suppose I am comparing between two states, two states, just as we were using that very crude poverty example where two countries, country A and country B uh, were doing differently. So if we compare two states here, what do we find? We find maybe that in terms of headcount, the states are doing in, uh, one state is doing better than the other, but when we bring in those dimensions of depth and severity of undernourishment of children, then we find maybe that the performances are changing, the relative performances change. So, and one more thing is that this is another exercise that we've done, that is between the last two rounds of the National Family Health Survey. What has happened to average and what has happened to MSDG? Now see, in the first block of states, that is the green block, there are certain states where both average and MSDG have fallen. That means the progress has been desirable. This is the kind of progress that we are looking forward to. That is, undernutrition total headcount is also falling and depth and severity are also, something has been done with regard to depth and severity, otherwise these would not have fallen. Now there is another case and the next block, that is where we have Andhra Pradesh, where average has fallen but MSDG has risen. Now what does this imply? This implies that average has fallen. How would average fall? 
with MSDG rising. This is possible only when the improvement has been near the cutoff. Those who are marginally undernourished, their lot has been improved to some extent, so that the, they have shifted just above the cutoff. But with respect to death and severity, the children who were more, des more deserving maybe of policy action, not much could have been done with respect to their status, otherwise MSDG wouldn't have risen. Now, with respect to um, another state, see the third block, that is Punjab, we find that average is falling, but MSDG has remained constant. This is also somewhat similar, because nothing, not much change has happened with respect to death and severity, although there has been some improvement near the cutoff. That is, children who are marginally undernourished have faced some improvement. Now, we have another block where Average has risen, but MSDG has fallen. We have all kinds of cases here, actually. So Assam and Madhya Pradesh are those two states where average has risen and MSDG has fallen. Now, this implies that there has been overall failure. Unless, otherwise, uh, average wouldn't have risen. Headcount ratio has risen. But MSDG has fallen, which means that there has been some targeting at the lower end. The targeting has been effective at the lower end, but overall the performance has not improved much. And there is this block with Haryana and Bihar, where average has also risen and MSDG has also risen. That is, this is the worst case that possibly can happen. And we have another state, Gujarat, which is also not much better, because average has risen, MSDG is remaining constant. So not like Assam and Madhya Pradesh, where at least something has been done at the, uh, towards targeting. Now, Maharashtra is a case where we find that average has remained constant, MSDG has fallen which is uh, somewhat similar to, again, what has happened in Assam and Madhya Pradesh. And in Kerala, both have remained constant. Kerala is um, a better performing state. So no, um, we cannot judge in th that way that Kerala is doing better than MP. It's not like that. This is just what has happened, the dynamics over the last two rounds of the NFHS. So you know, this kind of analysis is possible only when we use measures such that take into account the notions of death and severity. If we would remain restricted to headcount, this picture would not have emerged. That is the whole point. So this is the first part of uh, my uh, presentation, which focuses on uh, the death and severity dimensions which need to be incorporated in case of uh, the measures which have health variables which are measured in terms of certain cutoffs. Uh, see, uh, this could be extended to anemia for what happens in case of anemia there. Hemoglobin level in M, as again you would be knowing much better than me, that the outcomes are more severe as uh, we move down the cutoff. As we move further down the cutoff, the outcomes are more severe and the severity again increases at an increasing rate. So instead of looking at the percentage of undernourishment, we could also, uh, percentage of anemia, the percentage of women, for instance, suffering from anemia. We could look at such measures, which are the measure that we are proposing, now which take into account the uh, dimensions of death and severity as well. So that was the whole point of the first part. Now coming to the second part, which is on determinants of health variables. Now uh, very often in biomedical studies also we find such analysis, that is in medical journals also, we find a um, number of articles coming up with the determinants of a certain health condition. Now, um, the, my point is that we need to be very careful of certain issues when we do such analysis because, see, I will concentrate again on undernutrition as an example. Now, if child undernutrition, ch child's nutritional status is the dependent variable, okay, then if I formulate a model, I have seen many biomedical studies which consider any variable that can be important as a as an explanatory variable. How do people go about selecting these variables, maybe from literature survey and even from common perception? I think that this is important, so I include it. And I find that it comes out to be significant, so I'm done. But the whole point is that this is kind of ad hoc and technically problematic also, because if I keep on including variables, the first thing that will, may happen is multicollinearity issue will be there very first. But then there is also another problem which I'll um, elaborate. See, uh, now focusing exclusively on nutritional status as a dependent variable, if uh, there is one approach using the health production function, okay, it models nutritional status as a function of 
the in uh, see what is a production function it is a concept of microeconomics which is a technical relation giving uh, the level of output that can be produced using different combinations of inputs that's in a factory about some good or service that is produced now an analogous concept in the in the context of health economics is health production function which takes this health status as the output and the inputs that are going to um, shape this output the different combinations of inputs which will produce this health um, are taken uh, usually as c y is the nutritional status it is modeled as a function of i is the inputs the direct inputs what are the direct inputs what is the child fed okay breastfeeding whether the child is breastfed or not maybe the duration of breastfeeding then whether immunization has taken place or not and it goes on like that you can take in umpteen number of inputs then c what is c c is the uh, group of variables that um, denote the child characteristics okay age of child sex of child birth order of child these are important m is maternal characteristics all of us know that a mother's education mother's nutritional status are all very important in shaping what happens to a child's nutritional status then we have f as uh, dr dotto was also uh, mentioning in her presentation father's characteristics are also important parental characteristics there are many studies which have modeled um, characteristics of family members uh, other than parents okay uh, education of the um, uh, household head for instance maybe the parent is not the household head someone else is the household head then h is the household characteristic that is uh, the wealth uh, the income or wealth of the household e is the or and a number of other characteristics anything that you can think about um, a variable at the level of the household which is important for shaping a child's nutritional status e is the environmental characteristic okay the group of variables which um, um, are uh, under the category of environmental variables which shape a child's um, nutritional status child's health maybe uh, the government policy maybe uh, the health and hygiene awareness in the community there may be again an empty number of variables now what is the problem in this kind of approach see what happens here is firstly there may be data limitations you will not have so much data on everything that is important next i h and y are jointly or simultaneously determined now what happens here is see nutritional status is shaped by certain variables certain variables which determine the nutritional status of the child are also determining the input the level of input that the child is provided if this is the case then the basic assumption of uh, classical linear regression model the basic assumption that is required to do ols one of the basic assumptions is that the uh, independent variable and the error terms must be uncorrelated this is the very first one of the basic assumptions of clrm now this itself is violated when this happens when the things are jointly determined that is the um, dependent variable and some of the independent variables are determined by another set of variables if that is the case then my independent then my dependent variable will be correlated with the error term if that is the case then we cannot do ols but this is what very often we find such studies in biomedical journal journal so this is technically not sound and this is in fact wrong also so what in this case what will happen is the ols estimates will be inconsistent so what is the solution yes ordinary least squares regression that is the basic kind of regression that analysis that is done so if in biomedical studies um, we often find that a health variable is regressed on a set of other variables but then this can't be done if this problem is not solved now how do we go about um, um, uh, when there is a problem like this when there is a problem of joint determination of variables the solution there are a number of solutions one solution is to use instrumental variables as again professor dotto was mentioning in her presentation but that is often practically impossible instrumental variable to put it in very simple terms would be is that i instead of taking some variable as an as an independent variable the problem is that some of the independent variables are jointly determined with my dependent variable 
So an instrumental variable would be some variable that has a close correlation with this independent variable, but which is not jointly determined with the dependent variable. So theoretically, it would be okay to use the instrumental variables, but it is not possible practically to find proper instrumental variables. So our approach to this problem is we use the economic model of determinants. How do we do it? It is a bit technical, this part. Uh, what we do is, you see, household uh, at the household level, the very fundamental concept in microeconomics is the problem of utility maximization. Okay, A household has some level of utility. Maybe an individual, let us come focus on some individual. An individual economic agent is maximizing his or her own utility. And utility is actually the satisfaction. Okay, So the standard problem where in microeconomics is this individual agent is maximizing his or her utility and utility is depending on the consumption of certain commodities. Okay, suppose there are two goods X and Y. Now this person gets utility from consuming these commodities. So utility is modeled as a function of, this will be max U is a function of X, Y. I have missed the F here. Now the problem is what? Utility, the, this individual economic agent will maximize his or her own utility subject to his budget constraint. Okay, there is some, these commodities he cannot consume as much as he wants. There is a limit to the consumption. The limit is posed by the budget constraint. That is the prices of these commodities and the money income of the consumer. Now, solving this maximization exercise, the optimal amounts of the consumption of the goods is determined. Okay, so what we are doing here in health economics is, we are using these very notions, okay? The utility function here, instead of modeling utility as a function of those commodities alone, certain goods and con goods and services alone, we are here bringing in child health also as one of the arguments in the function. That is the household is having some utility from consuming certain goods and services, yes. Apart from that, the household also has some satisfaction from a child's well-being, the child that belongs to the household, if the child is has better health, the household has greater utility. So the household's utility depends on the child's health as well. So this is also brought in as an argument in the utility function. And in this way what we do is, we are actually, um, what we do in standard microeconomics is, maximization of utility subject to some budget constraint leads us to the optimal amounts of the commodities that the person is going to consume. Okay. Now here, we, what are we getting? Here we are getting the optimal child health, that is the health that is demanded, the health of the child that is demanded by the household. So we are having a demand function for the child's health. Instead of taking an ad hoc uh, specification, that is any variable under the sun that may be uh, influencing my, the child's uh, nutritional status, instead of taking making a model on that, instead of uh, taking nutritional status to be a function of an empty number of variables, anything that comes to mind, what we are doing here is we are rooting it in some economic model, the model of household choice, and we are actually trying to find out the demand function for child's health. So, what we are doing here is, now utility is maximized subject to a budget constraint, each individual's time constraint, and the child health production function. So, the child health production function that we had there, in our uh, previous case, yes, here, where why, as I said, this child health production function, where these inputs directly entered into uh, shaping the child health outcomes, instead of using that directly, what we are doing is we are using that now as a constraint. That is the household is maximizing its utility and apart from the budget constraint, that is his total income, the person's total income cannot exceed his total expenditure. Similarly, we are having a notion which is giving us that the child health is determined by this production function kind of relationship. So when we do that in terms of uh, this model specification, we find that 
now nutritional status of children is depending on parental characteristics, uh, household factors, environmental factors and we are doing away with those direct inputs. That is the whole purpose of this exercise. Because using those direct inputs like breastfeeding, like immunization, which are jointly determined with nutritional status, the parent who is uh, responsible for providing the immunization of the child, certain variables are determining the parent's choice to provide those uh, immunization uh, services for the child. Those very, 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 those very variables are again determining the nutritional status of the child. So there is a problem of endogeneity of joint determination. In order to do away with that, we are using this kind of demand function approach where we are making this approach free from the direct inputs. So we no longer have those direct inputs. Nutritional status is now a function of only the, micro, the variables in the microsystem of the child that is the child characteristics, the parental characteristics, then we have the mesosystem where we have the household factors and the exosystem that gives us the environmental factors. Now here, I will point out some interesting studies. See we have, uh, apart from here, when we are saying utility maximization, as if we are assuming that everyone in the household has the same kind of choice. It may not be the case that everybody in the household has this, places the same value on child's health. The mother may be placing more, the father may be placing less and it may be vice versa. So there are also bargaining models where we bring in this notion of competing interests of household members. So what happens is that certain studies have shown using those models. Now there is a common perception that improving mother's empowerment, that is maternal empowerment, there are many studies on this also, many biomedical studies, which show that increasing maternal empowerment improves child nutrition. And people take it um, as if this is very an expected kind of relationship. But it may not be the case, as many studies have shown that one study particularly has shown that sons of, uh, in Indonesia, sons of Javanese and Sumatran mothers with greater empowerment now how do they measure maternal empowerment? They measure it by the proxy of the, they proxy it by the size of assets brought at marriage. The more assets the mother brings in at marriage, it implies that the mother is more powerful, the wife is more powerful than the husband. So this is, um, they have observed that in Indonesia this is the social norm that the more resources the person brings in, if the husband brings in more resources, the husband is more powerful. So that is just an indicator of maternal empowerment and using that they have found that mothers with greater sons of uh, mothers with greater empowerment are likely to suffer uh, from significantly fewer episodes of morbidity than their sisters. So this is not a very uh, expected kind of relationship. People think that gender bias will go away if mothers are more empowered but studies can be shown to prove contrary results. Now we have another study which shows that nutritional outcomes are not better for boys. Nutritional outcomes per se are not better for boys. But parents invest more in healthcare for sons because of patrilocal residence. That is, this is a study in Assam. That is, uh, the girls are going away at marriage, so the parents are not investing in their healthcare. But at the intra-household level of food provision, there is no great difference between sons and daughters. They are fed equally, but in healthcare, when there's a constraint, budget constraint, the parents are spending more on sons. So this is another case. Now maternal income is, as another study has shown that maternal income is as good as income derived from other sources and makes no differential impact on children's nutrition. Then, even when girls are not discriminated against, it is the case we've often seen that uh, since uh, the fertility level, you know, it affects the fertility level, that uh, there are more children when there are girls in a family, that till there's a son, the parents are desiring more children. So girls are by default living in households with greater number of children. So they are having poorer outcomes. Now a greater effect, rather than focusing on mother's income and empowerment, we have found a large number of studies which show a greater effect of mother's schooling on long-term nutrition of girls than that of boys. Mother's education rather is, um, helps much more to do away with this gender gap. And this is all in the literature. 
Now, uh, this is the last part of my presentation. I would focus on the role of public and private factors. You know, in this model itself, we can place these variables, the variables at the private level and at the public uh, level. That is, access to public facilities and the private resources of the household. Now, what do we find? Now, we have used this in our own analysis uh, using uh, the India Human Development Survey data. What we found is, we have formed an index of availability of public infrastructure. Now, this is a weighted average of access to maternal health care, access to child health care, access to general health care, and access to food. So, this is an index of public facility. And we have also considered, we have actually considered the availability and not the actual utilization. Because if we would consider actual utilization, it would again be jointly determined because the parents themselves would decide whether the services are utilized or not. Now, different, and now uh, I won't get into these details. We'll come to the results directly. What we find is, you see, we have used OLS, okay, that is ordinary least squares regression to see which variables are significant in uh, shaping these outcomes. And we have found that both private incomes and public factors are significant. Not only the household wealth, but also the access to government infrastructure are significant. Now we have used another technique which has helped us to find out whether these effects vary across the distribution of children. That is, see, the as in the case of our measure of undernourishment, we were saying that this notion of depth is important, okay? We were saying that not just the average level, but the depth is important. So, now in the case of finding the determinants also, we have seen that, see, intuitively, a factor that is significant in affecting the nutritional, fun nutritional outcome of a child who is severely undernourished may not be so in determining uh, the nutritional outcome of a child who is above the factor. These factors may differ. Um, certain factors may operate differentially or, or depending on the level of undernourishment of the child. So there is a technique called quantile regression which we have used and we have seen that across the distribution, these factors are actually different. That is, we find yes, that while private income is significant and positive factor in affecting child nutrition throughout the distribution of children, Public facilities are overall failing to make any difference to the well-being of the worst affected children. That is, those who are belonging to the lowest quantity. That is, those who have the most severe outcomes, who are at the bottom end of the distribution of nutritional status, those children are not deriving any benefits from this private factor index. That is, the private factor index is not being significant for those children who are at the bottom end of the distribution. This is what we have found. Now, it makes a, this public factor makes a significant and positive impact on the nutritional status of the relatively better of children. Those who have a better score, comparatively better score, that they are deriving some benefits from the availability of public services, but the worst affected ones are failing to derive any benefits from the public facilities in general. That is when we take the composite index. So we can conclude that mere existence of public infrastructure cannot guarantee that the benefits are actually reaching the most deprived sections of the population. Now what we find here is when we are decomposing the effects of G, that is the public facility index, and we inspect the effects of each uh, component of this public facility index, we find that the existence of an Anganwadi center makes a significant and positive improvement for the most deprived. It does make a significant and positive improvement for the most deprived, that is those at the bottom 10% of undernourishment. Only the relatively better of children can avail of the benefits from a health subcenter. This is what has emerged from our analysis. Now, uh, we find that um, existence of a, uh, yes, 
So the positive effect of a government Anganwadi center is failing to make the overall public facility index significant. Though the presence of an Anganwadi center does make some difference, the overall positive, uh, overall public facilities are not making any difference for the worst affected children. But again, health sub center is significant at the upper end, that is those who are better off, they are deriving significant benefits from the existence of a health sub center, but government facilities overall are also significant at the upper end of the distribution. So these are the results actually, regression results, I won't get into the details, so I would stop here actually. So we have, um, before stopping just one more sentence, that we have focused on the measurement and determinants of nutritional status and at both levels we have um, tried to make the point that not only is the proportion or the average level important, the depth is important and the whole distribution of nutritional status is important no matter what, we, what our purpose at hand is, whether it is measurement or it is finding out the determinants. And the parallels can be drawn in the, con in the case of other health variables which are measured in terms of such cutoffs. Thank you. Four presentations and you have heard them. Uh, I won't try to summarize or further clarify any of this. Uh, we have 45 minutes. Little I think 50 minutes or so because Simantini has utilized her time very efficiently. So we have almost like 50 minutes or so. Uh, so how do we go about it? Let me first, <coughs> uh, okay, even though I said that I won't summarize, but just one or two points uh, before I uh, leave it to you. Uh, questions and uh, comments, uh, clarifications. This is from the beginning, from now you can see the structure of the whole, whole uh, this workshop, probably. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I, I started with this basic concepts of health economics, which actually gave us this some uh, conceptual uh, tools to analyze different kinds of healthcare, that means curative, vis-a-vis, -vis, preventive, promotive, etc. And I also demonstrated how uh, this conceptual uh, thing actually helped us to illuminate the normative policy questions. That means whether or not public health uh, services should be left to the market forces or not, those kind of questions. So those are the normative policy questions which actually could be illuminated straight away from those conceptual things. Then, at the end of it, I said that if it is entirely to the market forces and if the market is perfectly allocating things, then we don't have to worry about evaluation. Why? Because consumers are sovereign. Consumers are choosing according to their preferences and consumers are paying for that. If that is the kind of market, because we don't evaluate how TVs actually benefit people. We don't evaluate how toothpaste actually benefits people, right? But we do evaluate how certain healthcare interventions uh, benefit people. Why? Because it is a non-market kind of allocation system that we are talking about, talking about. So as soon as we move to these various kinds of non-market allocation mechanisms, then immediately Shubhra's thing actually comes in. That means how you make sense of any kind of intervention from societal point of view, from the you know organizational point of view, that means whether or not you know uh, by this criteria of cost benefit analysis, certain interventions make sense or not. Similarly, cost effectiveness analysis, which is a little bit less ambitious than cost benefit analysis, because cost benefit analysis you have to evaluate both costs and benefits, and benefits have to be monetized as well, which Subrata clarified clearly. But less ambitious one is cost effectiveness analysis. And he uh, spoke about that and he demonstrated that, and particularly focusing on the benefit side, basically Delhi and Kuali, uh, he explained that. Then Arijita's thing actually, Arijita also focused on a particular methodology 
which actually is ex you know it's almost like on the frontier now and you know you see many papers which are coming up and you can even see these various international agencies they are coming up with this you know uh, this manual kind of thing how to do impact evaluation and Arijita is very much a practitioner of that so she in fact demonstrated uh, with the help of her own work uh, in the context of West Bengal that how this impact evaluation can be done meaningfully meaningfully because you know uh, there are a lot of uh, cautionary notes are there that you should do this you should do you shouldn't do that the last one Simontini Shivantini also focused on a very particular uh, thing that is measurement of uh, undernourishment of children and that is where she focused on but this is a kind of extension of this general idea about you know measurement and methodological issues and things like that which is a continuation of Subroto, Arjita and then Shimontini. Various methodological issues actually they discussed and Shimontini focused on first on the measurement of undernutrition and then the determinants. Now determinants are, are that kind of analysis is pretty general because you can, you know, most of the papers actually they talk about determinants of some kind, social determinants of health for instance, you know, there is another workshop I think on social determinants of health. So they are actually apart from the clinical interventions, you do talk about the social determinants which actually Shivantini focused on. So what actually Shivantini's uh, presentation was entirely what might be called social determinants of health, not so much just social. But among the explanatory factors, she took into account not only environmental factors, but also uh, the private factors, that is private wealth, private income, or asset holding, and things like that. So it's a in her model, actually, you see all you know, two, three kinds of uh, variables. And moreover, actually, those variables are not ad hoc. Ad hoc in the sense that it's not just you know, commonsensical that, OK, I want to include x variables, so I include that. No. So actually she derived those variables from a basic economic model of maximization on the part of the household. So household maximization model that actually throws up those variables which father, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, were dealt with, with regression techniques. Okay, so this is, you know, in a nutshell what we have done here. I think they're all integrated. So now it's uh, your turn, please, uh, if you will. <laughs> Ask any question, please. So we are here to answer your question. Okay, please go ahead. Um, when we talk, uh, talk about the cost bit, effective on this, we only talk about the daily and calling. I think this daily and call, if you put outcome as a daily and calling, and it becomes cost utility analysis, right? But it was never mentioned in the lecture. studies on cost effective analysis you will find hardly daily is used because uh, you find two types of uh, actually methodologies uh, in this especially cost effective analysis when the intervention is a medical uh, when the medical health intervention is of public health nature where others are also expected to be benefited apart from the target group then actually uh, you know uh, capturing the benefits is little more complicated than the health intervention which are mostly curative nature so i have seen study uh, uh, there's a study on uh, controlling the blood pressure so cost effective analysis doesn't have the restriction that you have to uh, you know always measure the benefit in terms of dali and quali you can take the variables you know benefits in their natural units you know whatever actually you intended to do you take the natural units but but that's not the case for the cost benefit analysis you know because everything has to be converted in an and my question is yes. by cost benefit analysis we have to take it in the natural units but if you convert the outcome in, into a dairy and quality, it became cost, cost utility analysis. No, no, no. Oh, there are studies, cost effectiveness analysis, where you can take the natural unit. 
Yeah. That's why. That yeah. That's the reason I am suggesting that you. Uh, yeah. You just go through the chapter five of this book, chapter five, ten, six, and seven, and you find that how for different cases. Yes. Effective analysis. They will take the outcome in the natural unit. Yes. 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 Mention the lectures which are around at the point. Yes. So yes. If you take a all year diary, it becomes cost utility analysis. Very. Yes. yes. Actually, you are right because uh, you know uh, ideally cost benefit analysis requires monetization of that. Okay. So diary and quality, still it is uh, life years. It's not entirely monetary, right? But with these life years, actually, you are you are right. You can do cost utility analysis. It's not cost benefit in the monetization. No, is that correct? No, no. He is saying that cost effectiveness analysis you can measure in you know national unit. You, but when you are using daily and quality, it's becoming cost utility analysis. What is? No, no. That's what you are saying. No. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm saying but the same, same thing. That is the cost effectiveness analysis of the national unit. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, natural units cannot be. Most people will just spill. Yeah, people hardly use. So he is not. He is not bringing the cost benefit analysis. He is only comparing between cost utility analysis and cost effectiveness analysis. So he is saying that if I am using quality and quality, it no longer remains a cost effectiveness analysis. It becomes cost utility analysis. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Not but this is what uh, actually uh, World Health Report. Right. Like. They use daily, and throughout they use the cost effectiveness analysis. Yeah. Yeah. They tell that it's a cost effective analysis, but still it is a cost utility analysis. Yeah. They really mean it is a cost utility analysis. Just yes, I want to add the name that it should be added. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Third one significant correlation with the duration of stay with the. A duration of stay with the uh, people resorting to uh, buying medicine from the fair price shop. Now, my question is: Have you studied in that uh, uh, study in that is it is it taking into consideration of efficacy of the drugs? Means what I guess is if those who are staying for longer duration means their drugs are not working well, then those patients were going quickly. expenditure during fair price shop uh, context my question is what do you mean by out of pocket expenditure what does it includes and what does it excludes and if uh, and a related question is if someone pays his uh, uh, bill to the municipality for supplying safe water whether safe water uh, safe drinking water he is paying a certain amount of tax for that does that tax 
includes in out of pocket health care expenditure? Concept I will say that whatever you pay out of your own pocket to buy something. Why this is important, I tell you, because uh, Ajita must have uh, given you an idea why uh, healthcare is, has certain properties, uh, which uh, which means that there is lots of government intervention in it. So what is happening? Whatever is my healthcare need, I am not buying everything from the market. A part of this is financed by the government. Again, in, within the market, a part of this is financed by the third party payment, that is the insurance agency. But whatever I am paying for, from my pocket directly is a part of my out of pocket expenditure. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are talking about the taxation bill for water or say for a, anything, they are also out of pocket expenditure, but not out of pocket expenditure on health. I am focusing on health and normally it is defined as the curative health. Sometimes it's also taken for vaccines and for uh, those kind of preventions, but not exactly for uh, water or something like that because in that way there will be an unending list, you know, which can uh, come into my, uh, affect my healthcare production function. So there can be an unending list, even the electricity. If I do not have electricity, my eyes uh, can go, go worse, right? So it, it, when we normally we use out-of-pocket expenditure to buy anything, any healthcare product. Uh, if I may add uh, one or two points here, I think uh, uh, this is that uh, the large-scale surveys uh, on healthcare utilization. Uh, so that's the only source of information on our pocket expenditure for us, right? Like National Sample Survey. Now, National Sample Survey, it starts with the illness. That means during this particular period, whether you are ill or not. Now, if you are ill, then did you go to this hospital or, or government or, or private? If you go to government, how much did you uh, uh, spend? And if you go to private, how much did you spend? So you see the chain of uh, uh, this connection, actually. The connections, actually, if you are ill. Now, obviously, what you are talking about is basically preventive kind of thing. So, you know, you are not yet ill. So you did it earlier to prevent something. So that's not out-of-pocket expenditure on health as such. So health would be, if you are ill, then how much you spend. That's, that's how, how I understand. So insurance premium is not included in such a basic No. In, at least in national sample insurance premium is not included. Thank you very much for, the, for those presentations. You mentioned that um, we put um, healthcare in the market forces. And with a, if we put it in a market, there's competition. And when there's competition, there's choice. And therefore, the consumers would be able to get the best. How would you then set up um, the market to have a, one, to achieve universal health care, and two, that it will be a perfect, there's perfect competition, and then there's perfect health care, there's perfect choice, and there's quality. Because that's what we lack definitely in all health care systems. Uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, I mean, there is no uh, single answer to this question, but uh, I can tell you my understanding. Okay. You see that it's not that the government is going to create a market or government should create a market. Markets evolve. Now, markets evolve. Now, in our context, actually, there is a market for private care. I mean, care by the private sector, care is being bought and sold, and care is being bought and sold. But, you see that if you look at different states' experiences, for instance, in Kerala, in Kerala, the money that you spend or the amount that you spend on private vis-a-vis -vis public, the difference actually is much narrower compared to a state like West Bengal. Now, what does it mean? It means that if you go to a private hospital in West Bengal, you pay seven times as much as you pay in a government hospital. Now, government hospital also, you have to pay some money you know, here and there. So you pay seven times as much as you pay 
if you go to a public hospital in West Bengal. That's the average. In Kerala, it's 2.5 times as much. So what does it mean? It means that because of a good supply of you know, reasonably cost, reasonably priced private care in Kerala. Now, why is it so? Because the government sector is also working. Uh, you see that uh, I would love to, but <laughs> but as a practical person, I think all of us are. So we want to suggest that because you cannot abolish private sector given the kind of economy that we have. Now, if you abolish public sector, a uh, private sector. Then what would happen? I talked about consumer sovereignty. <laughs> so the consumers actually will vote with their feet. What is that? Voting with their feet? They will go to Singapore. Because you cannot stop them from going to Singapore. If you cannot stop them, you know, going to even Myanmar or Bangladesh. So the private sector in Bangladesh will flourish. And no private sector in India. Would you like that situation or not? <laughs> So there are difficult questions to address, you know. Hello. We've been told that the fair price management shops give a discount of around 50 to 70 percent or more than that. So how is it possible for them to give such a large amount of discount and still keep a profit? Yeah. Actually, uh, as I said, they are supposed to sell uh, generics and branded generics. So essentially, if you look at the normal pharmaceutical market, uh, if you look at think of a flow chart, it starts with the pharmaceutical producer, then the wholesaler, then the retailer. Right? Uh, there's a some uh, shares of um, commission to the wholesaler, then to the retailer. And at the end, uh, we have the consumers. But consumers in healthcare, they are the problem is that they do not make their own choice. It's the doctors who make them, their choice on behalf of them. Right? So what is happening that in order to promote their particular brands, the pharmaceutical companies are using some promotional expenditures right, for their own brands. But from generic brand, branded generics, for uh, the branded generics, they are not using any promotional expenditure. So what they are doing, they are directly giving their uh, product to the retailer. And they are not also giving any promotional expenditure for the doctors. So in the entire market, two agents, two intermediaries are gone, doctors and wholesalers. So what is happening that they are directly giving their drugs to the retailers, a huge amount of discount. The retailer is retaining a part of this uh, discount and passing on the rest to the consumers. So the consumer, at say the retail MRP is 100, now they are receiving that price at say 75 rupees. So 25% discount. And this is, so far this has been working for West Bengal because of the fact earlier, I know that there are many government hospital doctors here, but actually, you, all of us you know actually better than me, that what is happening, that what in terms of economics would be called, doctors are inducing the demand. Because for healthcare, the demand is a derived demand, right? So they are inducing the demand. And normally what is happening, that there is a tacit collusion kind of a thing between the pharmaceutical company and the doctor. Here, the doctor is being entirely bypassed. Wholesalers are entirely bypassed. So the pharmaceutical companies are saving, produce a surplus, and they are directly selling it to the retailer. Retailers are holding some amount of discount and passing on the rest of it to the consumers. So both are win-win situations. So far, so good. But if this, uh, I, I, I'm sure that a part of the doctors' uh, lobby as well as the wholesalers' lobby, obviously their vested interest is against this. So they are not liking this entire. You know, they are being eliminated from the entire system of working. So they do not like it. So if they 
try to kind of uh, try to build up a different kind of a pollution, I'm sure that imperfection in the market will come back. Because as what Ajinda, I, I suppose what he has said in the morning, that the problem of the healthcare market is that that there is a kind of a pseudo competition. See, we have we are one of the most developed pharmaceutical industry in the world. So what was expected that there are plethora of producers and so hence there will be a perfect competition. That is not happening in the general market because there is a collusion, there is a kind of a nexus between two agents. If you can take care of one agent, it might lead to a proper competition. And that might be happening. So pseudo competition is kind of a thing is going back. Right? So that is how they are giving us such a high discount. Right now, I'd like to remind you to give us about the insurance markets, which you promised us. Insurance market? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, because of lack of time, I couldn't uh, talk about that. Uh, so briefly, just uh, two, three minutes, maybe the basics. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I promised that I would cover insurance market. So what are the basic issues in insurance market? What does an uh, insurance, insurance market do? Okay, the insurance market basically, it's the, just like any other market which buys and sells certain product. Uh, insurance market buys and sells, sells risk. Some people are buying risk, some people are selling risk. So risk is the product, okay? Now who are selling risk and who are buying risk? The consumers. Uh, those who are insured, uh, insured uh, they are selling their risk to the insurance companies and insurance companies are buying the risk. Now why should the insurance companies buy your risk? Because they can make profit. How, how do they make profit? Because they pool individuals risks. So there are hundred uh, consumers of insurance and the insurance company actually pulls the risk and the insurance company knows very well that all the hundred person will not fall in at the same time or you know whatever with, during the year. So they have this risk calculation based on based on a population epidemiological profile. So with this epidemiological profile you can actually calculate the cost, the risk and you know how much the insurance company may have to pay in terms of this, you know, this uh, uh, money to the, to the consumers if they claim. So the claims. So that's the calculation of insurance company. So they also make a profit out of that. Now the point is that, why is it that the insurance market is so thin in India, but it's working uh, in, in US? Now there are different aspects of it. In US, insurance market is working that is the assumption, but still, there's a large section of population who are not insured in US. Now, why why are they not insured? Because they are not insurable. That means the kind of premium they are willing to pay, insurance companies are not ready to sell their insurances to them at that price. Just like any other market. So, insurance market works in that way, at least as far as this particular thing is concerned, that given the market price of premium, Obviously, there is no single market price for, for insurance. The premium actually varies depending on your age and your illness profile, uh, your history and all. So, I'm talking about the average price. The, uh, so, depending, so the price actually, uh, the market throws up a price given the demand and supply of insurance. And that price actually may be exclusionary for some consumers. So, some consumers, they are not able to pay even that price, just like any other product. So that's why, like 20% or so, Americans, they are not insured. So this insurance-based system is exclusionary in that sense, because if it is a private insurance, premium-based, then many people actually uh, cannot afford to pay the premium. In case of India, no matter how, how hard the insurance companies try, but still our insurance is not even 5%, less than 5%, I think, or so. So why is it so? Because a large number of population, you know, either they have lower valuation of risk, that means they feel that 
no, 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 it's not that risky. So unless someone actually falls ill, one doesn't realize that, you know, how much it would cost if one falls ill. So it's a kind of underestimation of private risk. That could be one. So the demand for insurance is low in India for a variety of reasons. One reason could be that lower perception about risk, their individual risk. That could be one thing. But the other thing is that the, the, there is a problem of thinness of insurance market everywhere, not just in India. So this is a thin market. Why? Market is thin. That means it's not... Uh, uh, why, that, why is it that insurance market uh, doesn't uh, expand as fast as we, we would like to see? Because of other pro problem, which is called problem of moral hazard. So what is the problem of moral hazard? I go back to my asymmetry of information kind of idea. That is, asymmetry of information, I spoke about doctor-patient relationship, but now I am saying asymmetry of information between uh, insurance company and the client. Now here, actually, the relationship is the opposite. That is, the client knows more than the insurance company. Because I know my health, so I can suppress that to the insurance company. And insurance company doesn't have any clue you know, what my health status is, what is my history and all. So I can actually, you know, uh, sort of uh, hide that information from the insurance company. So insurance company, with that lack of information, insurance company may end up uh, losing money because of uh, because of this, uh, you know, lack of information about my health. So, you know, after doing, after uh, buying the insurance, maybe next day, you know, there, there's a high probability that I'll fall ill which actually I suppressed. So this is this is one. The other one is actually, this is not moral hazard, but moral hazard actually says that I will not take enough care of my health if I am insured, okay? So if I am insured, then I know that insurance will pay. So I will not take enough care of myself because taking care of myself is costly. Since I am paying already the premium, I am not willing to pay that cost to take care of myself. So it's, I, I, I would like to leave it to the insurance company. So that is called moral hazard. That means post-contractual devi deviant behavior, basically. So when we get into the contract with the insurance company, the understanding is that, OK, I'll behave in certain way, but actually I'm not, which means that post-contract deviant behavior on the part of the client, and that's called problem of moral hazard. And because of this problem of moral hazard, insurance companies are reluctant to sell insurance to everyone, particularly those who are considered to be high risk. Now, high risk populations never get uh, insurance coverage. So that's a real problem. So in our context, you'll find that you know this, uh, many of these old people everywhere, actually, older, elderly people actually find it very difficult to pay the premium for their uh, health insurance. So health insurance is never a solution. Uh, for our kind of system, and many I know many private private entrepreneur private hospital entrepreneurs they actually forcefully uh, promote uh, uh, insurance, but insurance is not a solution. In fact, even the insurance state paid insurance premium that is RSBY uh, for the poor actually you know what is happening there because it's basically bleeding the exchequer, but at the same time, people are not getting the benefit. It's the private hospitals, which actually is in a cornering the 30,000 rupees just by doing unnecessary you know, surgical intervention. So you know, that, that, can be, that kind of perverse kind of uh, outcome you can see if you uh, introduce insurance premium given by the government or the, or the state. That's another problem. So in other words, these are the, you know, in summary, these are the problems of insurance. If you have any other question, maybe.
Economically viable or politically feasible because then you are actually uh, compromising with the idea of the consumer sovereignty. People will just go to the other places where such restrictions are not there. Now, uh, can you think uh, of a situation where government's role is just restricted to uh, the, the financing and regulations and monetary, and the entire uh, the provisioning is left to the private market? What are the possible costs and benefits of such a arrangement? Yes, uh, now we are talking about health systems. Uh, I think these two questions are somewhat related, so I'll, I'll answer them. You see that uh, this is this is the issue that is. Uh, uh, let me first uh, respond to that. Now, how do you visualize government's role in the healthcare system? Now, government can be financer but not provider. Government can be both financer and provider. Government can be just regulator without being either financer or provider. So in other words, government's role, if I can visual, if I want to visualize government's role, there are basically three types of role. Finance, provisioning, and then regulation. Okay. The regulation part, I think people have no doubt about it, that government must play that regulatory role. About the first two, I think people have, you know, no cons I think people don't, don't never reach consensus on that. Now, one idea is that, okay, government finances, but provisioning is done by the private sector, because private sector is better or more efficient in delivering the services. Only thing is that, Private care is costly. That's why government has to step in to cover that cost. So this is the idea. So this is basically it's the uh, this separation of financial financial role and provisioning role of the government. Earlier days, actually, all of our health policy documents they put them together. They always thought about government as the provider, provider only, and provider. Of course, it's from government's money, taxpayers' money. So at some point, actually, people started looking at the, these two things separately. Now, RSBI is something like that. That means it's a government for BPL population. Government is paying the premium, and you get the service from the either private or public. You can go to public as well, but usually people go to private. So you you can go to private up to the cap that is thirty thousand. Now what is this? This is actually government is actually uh, taking the financial role, but not direct provisioning role. Okay. Now is that the best solution? I have said that it's not because of this huge problem of moral hazard here. Because if government is unable to run its own hospitals, this provisioning role, if the government is inefficient in doing that, how how can you imagine that government is powerful enough? to monitor this contract between RSBI uh, uh, clients and uh, and the private sector. Because private sector, they are much more clever you know, than these government people. So in other words, if the assumption is that government is unable to run its hospitals because government is poor, is not capable enough, then how can we assume this high capability of government when it comes to RSBI? Because you know it's it's contradictory. So government can never actually monitor RSBY as far as the private sector's moral hazard problem is concerned. So that that part, I think it would be highly expensive. But on the face of it, it looks like that poor people are getting benefit. But I think you can benefit. You can uh, you can uh, benefit the poor people at a lower cost instead of insurance. So direct provisioning, now coming to uh, Subhuta's point, 
So for certain services, like core services, core curative services and public health services, maybe direct provisioning is the most efficient way of doing it. But if it comes to certain curative services, which are technologically, I mean, because of the nature of the technology, it's highly expensive, no government on earth can, can actually provide it to, you know, can universalize that kind of service. I mean, can any government universalize, you know, dialysis, for instance? I mean, dialysis for everyone, at, you know, free of cost. No, we don't have resources to do that. If you want to provide dialysis, Whoever needs it, free of cost, no government can do it. If you want to treat the cancer patients free of cost, whoever wants it, whoever needs the treatment, it's impossible by any government, isn't it? So in that case, you need to make kind of separation between some kind of services, more expensive kind of services, you just separate it out, leave it to the private sector, maybe. Now, doesn't it increase inequality? Because I'm a cancer patient, I don't have money, I don't get care, uh, the care. But uh, you know, those who have money who go to uh, private sector, they, they get care. Well, I have no answer. Because given the resources of the government, limited care for cancer patients can be done by the government. So ultimately, you have to fall back on this, the core provisioning role of the government. The core provisioning role of the government, that has to be there. You cannot just ignore that and leave it to the private sector. That's my point. But some private sector would creep in because of this high cost kind of thing. Yeah. It does it? Yeah. So, sir? Yes, yes. yes. Sir, sir. Um, I'm a bit um, skeptical about your points. Okay. One, Go ahead. talking about equity. Yes. The more that the people get richer, healthcare becomes a luxury good. The more that they will keep on buying. That's a fact, right? That's already a, like everyone knows that. Therefore, for example, India keeps on getting richer, a certain population. Then you're coming up with a sector where they are the only ones who can afford all the very expensive healthcare. And if you leave the healthcare system for the poor just for the with the government, you are creating a system where they will never get a good health care. That's another fact that you mentioned. The more that the population gets, I mean the poor people are still are getting more, the government still keeps on paying a lot, so it becomes more expensive to the government. There's always a cost for health care. There's never free lunch, right? So if I disagree with your point that the government should be providing, should have the provision um, role. I still believe of the health insurance system, autonomous, ring-fenced, where the government could put in a universal health insurance system, whether it's rich or poor, can get from the pool basic services so that the services will be equal with the rich and the poor. Would you See agree? That you, you are, I mean, you're assumption, underlying assumption is that government can efficiently manage a national health, a national well, well, insurance. Why, no, just why don't finish. you appoint the people from the private sector no, no, just, to, just to hold the government finish. position? Government can manage well a national, nationalized insurance system, which actually contracts with the private sector. So that is your assumption? Government can very well do yes, that? Yes, it has been done in many countries already. No. Netherlands, United Kingdom. I mean, these are advanced economies. I know there are many challenges. It's not insurance. No, no, no. You are, I think you are confusing between insurance. Insurance is purely it's a risk-based kind of thing. The premium is being paid by the state. That's the only difference. So insurance system, if it is insurance system, but if it is reimbursement system, for instance, basically it's a reimbursement. So you go to private hospital, government reimburses. Like our state government employees here, like the central government employees here. That's a different story. But so long as it is an insurance system that's basically risk pooling kind of thing, then how can you imagine that, you know, how, how do you imagine that government actually is efficient enough to contract with the private sector where this RSBY kind of 
abuse will not take place. How do you ensure that? That's my question. You, you are, if it runs well, fine. I mean, I, you know, I have no problem. You already answered, I mean, these are very important global issues which we right. are discussing. Yeah. If you are rich, you pay your health premium. If you are poor, the government will subsidize until you get rich. Sure. That's how to, to ensure equity in healthcare system. And then you pull all the health insurance in one, and whoever needs it, would yeah, get from I know it. this insurance thing actually. I know you're a bit negative of insurance system. Sure. You know, I, I mean, I think, I think as, uh, as an economist, I think most of us, I think, would find it very difficult to accept this insurance-based system. Shubhrata has seen Canadian system. It's not insurance-based. I have seen US system. It is insurance-based. And we know that the striking difference in terms of health Healthcare and health as outcome, you can see the striking difference between US and Canada. Even the capacity utilized of the hospital. Yeah. So the US system is not the private insurance system. The UK system is state insurance system. And Netherlands is state insurance system. It's two different insurance systems. British national health system that is not insurance based. It is state insurance based. It's government pulling this. No, no, no. It's not insurance based. It's not insurance based. Insurance, proper insurance based, look at RSBI. Is that the is that the national insurance model? It's not. Because there is a huge problem of moral hazard as far as the private sector is concerned. So that 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 cannot work. I know, I know many private sector, I mean private sector, no, you know many private sector doctors, they, they, they keep on saying that insurance is the solution and that is how they got RSBI, because of this lobby, that is, that is how they got RSBI and now RSBI is completely discredited and now we know that how private sector completely ruined this insurance system, completely ruined, whatever potential it had. It had potential, but private sector has completely ruined it. So in our context, how can you expect that the government would be able to manage this unruly private sector and greedy private sector with an insurance system? How, how, how do you expect that? I don't expect that. You see, government is not spending enough. Government is not spending enough. It's only 1% of GDP in India. Now, how many countries actually spend only 1% of GDP and claim huge claim, make claim, huge claims about uh, uh, future of health? You, you cannot have that a good future of health care so long as you spend only 1% of your GDP. The public expenditure is 1% of GDP. And you know the rest, that is close to 4% actually, is out of pocket. So, so the point is that, that Doing first thing first. You must raise it to, to at least 2.5 or 3. Raise it to 3 and see what happens. See what happens. I mean, there are, there are plenty of examples where this government provided health care, primary health care. There are many countries. Sir, I would like to share one of my experience. Yes. That in some suburban West Bengal areas, I know the uh, names of the uh, private sector providers. Patients come there for their sufferings regarding RSBI. I am talking regarding RSBI. So the private sectors, they, they take the money from the government and they also charge the money of that patient for doing the operations and other things. So they are getting money from two ends and that is for the scheme of RSBI. This is the yeah, actual. There, there are a lot of horror stories about that. Is Uh, please, 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 there's a question. 
Uh, it was found that out of pocket expenditure was less uh, for the buyers from uh, fair price shop. But still, 50 percent, uh, almost 50 percent are buying from outside. What may be the possible reasons? Or is it only for the brand name restrictions or any other? So that's what I showed in the analysis that why the factors that contribute to a healthier community and different from general informational uh, campaign, campaigns, it focuses on a policy change to address the social and environmental causes of an issue rather than on an individual behavior change. So advocacy is the, is the process of influencing outcomes including public policy and resources allocation uh, decisions within political, economic and social systems and institutions that, institutions that directly affect people's lives. So according to Wallach uh, in 1993, advocacy is a catch-all word for the set of skills used to create a shift in public opinion and mobilize the necessary resources and forces to support an issue, policy or constituency. So, advocacy seeks to increase the power of people and to make institutional institutions more responsive to human needs. It attempts to uh, to improve uh, the power to define uh, define problems and solutions and participate in the broader social social and policy arena by all the community. So, in the context of public health, advocacy is a powerful tool for us. Uh, it's central to protecting and promoting health and well-being, and is in the center, in the intersection, intersection of social, political, economic, and cultural forces in society. So, uh, this means that public health battles, uh, battles are often fought along political and behavioral fronts. And it requires committed, commitment to advocating for policy changes to support, that support development of health promoting environment. So, uh, besides of the different uh, different uh, definitions of public health advocacy, we have some common uh, common key elements 
There are the emphasis on collective actions to affect desired, desired systemic change, changes, a focus on changing upstream factors like laws, regulations, policies, institutional practices, prices and products as standards, for example, and an explicit recognition of the importance of engaging in political process to affect desired policy changes. So, uh, public health advocacy is often uh, defined as the process of gaining political commitments for a particular goal. And the tar target audiences tend to be decision makers, policy makers, program managers, and other people in position to influence actions that affect many people simultaneously. So, when you engage in, uh, in public health, it's important to know that political aspects are very important and they influence uh, uh, public health in different ways. It is also important to address social determinants of health as key component, components of uh, strategy to improve uh, health of our population. So, public health advocacy is an important strategy for creating environments supportive to health, of health. So, if the goal of public health is to reduce the burden of health problems in the society, it's important to have effective interventions that address the forces that foster these pro this problems. Other social and political dimensions of health cannot be ignored, otherwise you're going to, we're going to have only a superficial image of, of the solution that we think we are, we are helping with. So public health advocacy has been used to advance policies in several public health areas uh, like gun control, injury prevention, tobacco control, and other examples in, in, your, in your countries, in regional and international level. So I have many examples of su successful uh, public health advocacy. And different, uh, different ways to, to, to advocate for public health uh, our, critical, uh, our critical role of advocacy in translating research into policy, uh, practice and important changes in our, in our society. So it's really important to have uh, your work in your countries as public health advo advocates. We need your work. We're working here to advocate for public health and you need to do that in your country. So now, Dan is going to continue this presentation telling you how you can do that. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. Um, so, by way of introduction, my name is Dan. Um, I am married to Felicity, um, and we are both uh, junior doctors uh, working in hospitals uh, in the UK, in the north of the UK, in Newcastle. Um, and we've come to India for um, uh, two conferences and a field trip, so we're very excited to be here. Um, we did also just land this morning from the UK, so I do apologise if we're not particularly energetic. We're still quite jet lagged. Um, so, hopefully, now you're convinced of the value of advocacy. Um, but now we need to give you some tools to start planning how to do some campaigning. Um, so we really weren't sure how much experience there would be in this group, so apologies if it's a bit basic for some people and apologies if it's a bit advanced for others, um, but hopefully everybody will get something useful. Um, so just a, a quote from, this is from uh, Alice in Wonderland, which is a, a very English uh, novel for children. If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter which way you take. Now that's meant to be ironic, um, and hopefully will kind of convince you that we really do need to plan. Um, so, as we've said, we want this session to be interactive. So, um, I'm gonna ask you now just to turn to the person sitting next to you, and I'm just gonna give you two minutes, and just discuss between you, why do you think it's important for us to strategically plan our interventions, whether it be in advocacy or any other domain, but specifically focusing on advocacy and campaigning? Why is it important to strategically plan? And I suppose a similar way of asking, sorry, a different way of asking the same question, why, what, what would go wrong if we don't do that? So I'll give you two minutes, and then I'm gonna ask for some feedback. So um, just discuss that for two minutes, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
painting projects here, but this could be relating to any project, just generally the benefits of strategic planning. Give me 30 more seconds. Sorry, I know it's, it's tight timing, but we are already running late and we want to. Two minutes is over. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Okay. Yeah. Would you like to offer a suggestion? Okay, so we say introduce ourselves. I'm like, no, I don't think I need a mic. <laughs> I'm too much audible. Uh, we three introduce ourselves. And uh, first of all, I just got a hit there. Strat, I read it, start plan. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. My apologies, strategic, strategic plan. plan. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. So she clarified it, and whereby we just uh, got into it. Like we started, they usually have a timetable. Same thing, we cannot reach our goals or whatever the objectives or aims. We should have a strategic plan. That is, whereby we can uh, allocate our resources, funds, human, etc. So strategy is always needed for she clarified that what strategy is for long term and whether it is long term process or short term, whatever we have. Yeah. Absolutely, and we're going to split it down into that, and that's a great point that having a plan enables us from the start to allocate what resources we have, whether we've got loads of resources or very few. That's a really, really valuable point. Thank you. Regarding this, regarding the second question, what goes wrong? The quality of our uh, work, the goal there has to be achieved, might not be achieved. There's no good strategy planning. The work might be mismanaged. Resources, finances may not be properly utilized. So there are many things that need uh, to be managed for a work or a job to be accomplished. So all those things might be a mess. Absolutely. The work might be, be done, but they're not, they may not be good facing. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're dead right. Is there, is there anybody who'd like to um, give anything specific as to what might go wrong? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. The, the whole thing could go very badly wrong if we don't plan, but what specifically might go wrong? I think it's implied that uh, when you do any program, there must be a plan. The question arises whether the plan is feasible or not, whether it's proper or improper. The difference will be, I think, why strategic plan? There must be a strategic plan when you want to do anything. Anything in your life, there must be a strategic plan. If you, even if you want to marry, you must be a strategic, have a strategic plan. Okay, uh, and everyone knows if someone doesn't have any plan and he gets married, what, what, what wrong it can go, what the consequence. So the question is, what is a proper planning, what is the difference between how to choose this plan is proper or not? The evaluation of the plan, I think that's important. Absolutely, and I agree when you talk about feasibility. Doing a plan and realizing that your plan is not feasible is definitely preferable to starting on a project having not planned and ending up halfway down the line with your project and realizing that it wasn't feasible and you didn't realize. So early kind of, I guess, seeing into the future as to what problems may arise and being able to predict them and mitigate against them is, is a really helpful point. Thank you. Anybody else have a... The things that I thought of were um, having shared ownership. So we're going to talk about how to come up with a strategic plan specific to campaigning. Um, if you're a leader within, within a campaign or an advocacy project, um, it may be tempting to come up with the plan yourself and then recruit people to help afterwards. Um, but I want to try and convince you that it's important to have your group first and to plan together because having shared ownership of your project means that you also have shared accountability, which means that when things go well, everybody can take the credit and people feel generally boosted by that. But equally, when things go badly, people share the ownership as well. So it's great to do this in a group. And um, it's also really important for your monitoring and evaluation, which we will come on to later, um, and constantly being able to do that. And if you haven't set out what you want to do initially, then what standards are you defining yourself against? How do you know whether you're achieving them? Um, so having that plan there in your head, but also written down before you begin is really important. And it also helps us in the timing. 
So if you if you want to know what should happen first and next and next, and this should come before that, but that should come later, these are things that we don't necessarily think about in advance, but if we do, then we can plan more effectively. So this is a campaign concept which is taken from a book by a man called Chris Rose. It's called How to Win Campaigns. I recommend it. Um, we're going to go through this. Um, I'm not sure if it's a bit too small to read, but at the top it says ambition, what we want to achieve. Um, and that's about sort of big scale visionary type stuff. Um, and then lower down we're talking about campaign assets, actors, obstacles and interests. So that's the people who are involved, whether it be the people who are helping you, or the people who you are trying to convince, or the people who are going to stand in your way. Communication desires is all about how we communicate our message. And social weather conditions is really about the timing and trying to work out what's going on in the world at large and whether the world or whoever is going to be receptive to our campaign at a particular time. So some other terms to throw in there. Some of these may be a little bit more familiar to you, but the way I'm going to go through this is talking about vision and mission, which relates to ambition. We're going to talk about SWOT analysis, which you may well have come across, stakeholder mapping, communication techniques, some types of advocacy, and then some specifics about what types of goals and how to potentially put together um, some sort of planned document. It's going to be a real whirlwind tour though, so I apologise if it's fast. So, vision and mission. Would anybody like to have a bash at defining vision in this context? The vision for an for a advocacy project or a project in general? Mission can be uh, an objective in uh, some, uh, like in beautiful words, I can say it's an objective in words. Mission somewhere, it shows the activities in words. Is it yeah. so? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So the way I would describe it, hi guys, come on in. Um, the way I would describe it is a vision is what the world would look like when your campaign or your project has done its job. So when you've worked yourself out of a job, you've achieved your goal. The thing about a vision is it needs to be idealistic and it doesn't necessarily have to be achievable. The mission is a brief statement about how, in practical terms, you are going to work towards achieving that vision. So, just a quick note about vision. I think vision is something that's really important and I think a lot of us as health students or health professionals can sometimes lose our vision, we get entrenched, and it's quite hard to remember what it was that motivated us initially. We haven't got time for it, all of us to spend two minutes just reflecting on what our personal vision is right now. But can I just recommend that you do it? Just remind yourself, what is it that's motivating you to be here, to do what you do? And remember that that is really important because in campaigning, you need to speak from your heart to someone else's heart. It's not all about a head level. When you're convincing people of something, and Felicity's going to talk about the emotional level on which we need to communicate with people later, but it's really important, and these quotes kind of demonstrate that. Successful campaigns speak to the heart, so you need to come from the heart, and most campaigns are planned in the mind, won in the heart, and rationalized again in the mind. And I think when we talk in these academic spheres, we're good at talking on the mind level, and we kind of forget the heart level. And when it comes to campaigning, it's so, so important. So just connect with what your personal motivations are and then come up with that shared vision together for your campaign, whatever you're wanting to work on. So this is just an example. Um, Felicity and I come from the UK and we work with a, the Student Global Health Network in the UK. And this is what Medicine UK's vision is. So the vision is a fair and just world in which equity and health is a reality for all. So it's, as I said, it's big, it's aspirational. And the mission, um, a little bit longer, a little bit more tangible, um, and it's how we're going to achieve the vision. To create a network of students empowered to affect tangible social and political change in health on a local, national and global level through education, advocacy and community action. So we're on to SWOT analysis. And I'm going to go really quickly through this because I imagine this is something that people... Can I have a show of hands who's come across SWOT analysis before? So maybe a third haven and two thirds haven't. So I'll just explain it. So essentially, this is a way of um, analysing 
the, the, the sort of environment around you. So strengths and opportunities are obviously beneficial, positive things. Weaknesses and threats are negative things. And the key distinction is that strengths and weaknesses are intrinsic to your team, whereas opportunities and threats come from outside. So it's great, you sit down with your team initially, you're planning a campaign, let's do a SWOT analysis of what we're trying to achieve. What are the strengths that we have? What are the abilities, qualifications, um, experiences that we have amongst our team that are strengths? What are we not very good at? What are our weaknesses? What are the opportunities? What, who could we ask to help us? What resources are there out there for us? And what are the threats? Who's the competition? Who's out there to stop us doing what we're doing? And it's really important to just name those. And then you can, obviously, with the strengths and weaknesses, can work out how to make the most of them. And with the, sorry, with the strengths and opportunities, how to make the most of them. And the weaknesses and threats, how to mitigate them. So again, back to stakeholder mapping this time. So this is essentially just, just a, a similar sort of grid to encourage you to, when you're campaigning, when you're speaking to someone, when you're trying to persuade someone of something, we need to remember what sort of person they are. This is really crude, but broadly people may fit into one of these broad categories. So starting at the bottom, a sympathetic person is someone who is sympathetic to your cause. Someone who is uninformed may be sympathetic, but they just don't know what you're talking about. Critical people are skeptical. They, they, they understand what's going on, but they're not sure that they're convinced. And hostile people are the ones that are actively out to discourage you, to get in your way, uh, and they clearly actively disagree with what you are advocating for. And the important point here is that we need to deal with these different people in different ways. So sympathetic people, we want to recruit because they are sympathetic to your, your cause. You want to involve them in your, in your campaign. Uninformed people, we need to educate. You, they need to understand the issues. Critical people, we need to persuade. I would suggest that hostile people we don't bother with because it's too much time to waste on a small group of people and you don't need to convince everybody. So it's about working out where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. Don't focus on them, except for when the hostile people are the ones who you need to convince in order for, the, for whatever you need to do to happen. So if you need to convince the Minister for Health to do something and he's hostile, but he's the one with the power, then I'm afraid you're stuck with that. But otherwise, I would say steer clear of hostile. So back again. Just some really quick basic principles about communication techniques. So this is an example. Again, apologies if it's not very clear. So compare this notice. If you find a fire, one, let's work with your neighbours. Two, explain the issues and the, pro and the processes of ignition, fuel effects, oxidation and ion plasmas and address the social and economic justice dimensions. Three, educate decision makers regarding the establishment of an adequately resourced fire brigade and fire prevention culture, ask your neighbors to join in. With, if you find a fire, raise the alarm, go immediately to the place of safety and call the fire brigade. It's quite obvious that that is a preferable communication strategy and with this strategy, you've probably burned to death around here. So we need to be careful that we're communicating in a clear and simple way uh, that is appropriate to so whoever we've talked about within those categories that I mentioned just earlier. A few more key, so short and simple, we've covered, use different media, there are so many media out there now, increasingly with social media, with television, radio, online, Facebook, Twitter, um, it, campaigns no longer have to necessarily be people taking to the streets with their placards and their megaphones. It may be, and there's still value in that, but you can, you can advocate from the comfort of your room on your computer if that's what is, works best for you. So use different media, be varied. Plan events, use real stories, again going back to that, speaking to the heart, from the heart. Be proactive and try and provoke conversation. And yeah, try and put yourself in the shoes of your audience. Just very briefly, to, um, you, you may or may not have come across this concept of reactive and proactive advocacy. Essentially, um, it's important, sometimes if you want to campaign about a certain issue, um, but it's not topical at a certain time, say there's been a big media story about some, some disaster that's happened, um, 
it's going to be very difficult for you to then launch a campaign about something completely different because you're not going to gain sympathy for it at that moment. So think about the timing and think about how, we, how, we, how you identify the issues to campaign about. And essentially reactive is where you, something happens in the news, you see it and you react to it. Proactive is where you identify independently something which needs to be campaigned about and then you set up something. The key to remember is that whether you set up something reactively or proactively, it needs to be sustained, it needs to be long-term, you need to be committed to the cause. It's not that one is a quick fire and one is a, a slow strategy. You need to be committed in either sense. So, some, this is kind of basic strategic planning theory, but basically vision and mission we've covered, and you could call that strategic level goals. Moving down to tactical goals, you've got perhaps something that you could more describe as a long-term development plan. So if you were going to come up with um, some goals, maybe they would be more like five or six sentences, um, which again are quite broad, but they describe the work that you want to achieve within a broader period of time. Um, so this is an example from a palliative care project. Um, uh, so, some strategic objectives to promote professional development in palliative care through training of hospital staff and healthcare students, um, to increase awareness and involvement in palliative care services through advocacy, networking, and collaboration, to promote documenting, do documentation and reporting, and to facilitate academic research into palliative care service development. Now, you see, compared with the mission, that's a bit more specific, but it's still not, it's still not so specific that you can say, well, one person is responsible for this and um, tick, we know that it's done because it's not, it's not sufficiently specific. Um, but it's still useful to start, just to start drilling down. And then when we get down to the operational goals, um, this is where we get to our SMART goals. Now can I have a show of hands again, who's heard of SMART goals? So again, if you have, if you have. So essentially, any goal that you set yourself um, when we get down to the, the sort of specific level, needs to be smart. It needs to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And if any of your goals don't fulfill all of those criteria, then you need to modify them. So you need to say exactly what needs to be done. It needs to, again, going back to the monitoring evaluation, it needs to be measurable. You need to know when you've achieved it. It needs to be relevant, otherwise why are you doing it? And you need to have a deadline. Now it doesn't matter if that changes or you have to put it back, but it, it's important that any goal when it's written down is smart. And I would suggest that this might be a useful way of doing a table for your team if you're gonna to put together a planned document. So the strategic objective, which were the tactical goals that we had on the previous page, maybe um, you for the first tactical goal, that broad sentence, you may have five specific short-term goals that would go under it. So you specify which one. Say the activity, indicator would be what, what would it look like when that's achieved? So how, when do we know that it's measured and attained? When does it need to be done by? And importantly, I would really, really recommend that anybody at every single point has a, a person listed against it as being responsible for it. Otherwise, everybody will wash their hands of it within the team especially if it starts to slip. Again, go back to that shared ownership, shared responsibility, shared credit. So, this is my last slide, um, and this is just a suggestion for if you were gonna put together a document for the strategic plan for your campaign that you're gonna think of, um, then these might be some useful subheadings, and I think within what we've talked about, they're all fairly self-explanatory. Um, so, um, just as Felicity comes up, I'll give you a chance to jot them down if you want to. Fine, so I'm going to talk a bit about what goes wrong in public health advocacy. And you guys probably have a lot of experience about that as well, so I'm hoping we'll be able to share some of those. Because it is a very challenging field to work in. I think the first thing to say is that if you do everything well in planning, and you have a plan A for if things go well, and a plan B if things go a little bit less well, or a plan C and a plan D, you probably wouldn't have to worry about these challenges because you'd have planned for all of the different options. 
but actually real life tends to bring up things that we haven't thought about and we don't want to spend all our lives planning, we actually need to do something too. So what do you do about these problems when they come up? So, um, the first thing I'd like you to do is talk to your neighbours again. Tell them about a time when you've struggled with something. This could be within public health already, if you've tried to put up an intervention in place, or you've had a campaign, or it could be something really simple, like trying to change someone's mind about something. Um, you know, a type of food, or clothing, or something like that. It doesn't have to be public health at all. Um, and I want you to think about, what was the problem there? Why didn't that person agree with you? And how did you change their mind? Or how did you overcome the challenge? Okay, I'm gonna give you two minutes to think about that and talk to one another, okay?
we've talked about that over there as well, like a group of you to, to bring it forward. Um, Dan's already talked a lot about vision. I think if you don't have a clear vision that you can get people to sign up to, it's very difficult to ever make anything change. But even if you have a good vision, a lot of people don't communicate it enough, or frequently enough, or to the right people enough. You know, maybe the public needs to get more on board with your vision. You need to think about how you're communicating that to them if they're not buying it. We've also already talked as well about obstacles to the vision. That can be your status in the society, that can be a particular individual, that can be a lack of a particular resource, or it could be something in an old system that is stopping you from changing things. And sometimes you need to get that out of the way so that you can start afresh and try and move on in a new way from how you have before. Also, the lack of short-term wins. We've talked about the levels of strategic planning. And it's very easy when you're part way through a project to feel really discouraged because you can't see any good things coming out yet. But normally you have actually achieved something. Your team has achieved something, the project has done something. So it's recognizing all the key points on the way to your main overall success. So you can say, yes, we've done something good, well done us. And keep, keep that momentum going to finish the project off. Um, sometimes people can declare victory too soon. So that's saying, yeah, we're there, we've done it. But actually, you know, maybe people are saying the right things to you, but they don't quite believe it in their hearts. Or the other risk is that once things have changed, they just slip back to the way they were before because people aren't trying to keep the new thing going. Um, and those are really quite insidious risks, often because everyone's all tired by the time that they've made the change. So sometimes it's easy to 